Listener's discretion is advised as we'll be talking about mental health issues. If anyone out there is struggling with any mental health issues, call Lifeline on 131114 and please reach out to your family and friends. G'day! Welcome to True Blue History. I'm Adam Bloom. Today's special guest is author, photographer and metal mounter Michael Madden. In recognition of his book, The Victoria Cross Australia Remembers, Michael was made a Patreon and a life member of the Victoria Cross Trust in the United Kingdom. Michael's latest book, Dasher, The Kevin Wheatley VC Story, is out now. And Michael has joined us today to talk about why he came to write Kevin's book. Hi, Michael. Thanks for joining us on the show. Yeah, g'day, Adam. Thanks so much for having me on, mate. I really appreciate it. No, it's an honour and a privilege to have you on, mate. So can you share with us a bit about what life was like for you and your family as you were growing up as a young fella? Yeah, so I grew up on a dairy farm uh, in Gippsland uh, with with my family, mum and dad and my three brothers. It was a struggling farm. It was a pretty, it was a happy childhood, but it was difficult by today's standards. We didn't have a hot water system or... Uh, in didn't have an indoor toilet till I was 16. Um, so to get up and round the cows up on the motorbike and help dad milk the cows and um, it walk to school and all that sort of stuff. But uh, yeah, it was it was difficult. Um, and growing up with my dad, who is a, a Vietnam veteran, he's uh, TPI, so totally and permanently incapacitated. Uh, and I look back at it now as a, an adult um, and just with Mar- and marvel at my mum uh, because she, my mum had a horrible, violent and difficult childhood and in Sydney and dad took her away from that and she came down to this dairy farm with an alcoholic, misfiring, PTSD suffering Vietnam veteran, four kids, no family. Uh, we ended up homeless um, uh, later, a few years later. And you know what, all I remember is a happy childhood. Um, so, and I, yeah, I mean, that's pretty awesome. I really did have a happy childhood and that's, that's mum a hundred percent. So for you, like reading, how much reading did you do as a, a kid and who influenced you to read books as a young fella? When I was really young, I didn't read that much. I always wrote, always. I preferred to write my own things, even when I was six or seven. But my older brother, John, uh, who's, um, he now lives in California. He's a, a PhD, a very intelligent person. He put me onto a set of books by David Eddings, a um, fantasy series that just blew me away. And dad put me onto Tolkien because uh, dad was a big Tolkien fan and introduced us to The Hobbit at a fairly young age. And that Tolkien I loved and, you know, the, Folk of the Faraway Tree and things like that, but it was really when my older brother got me into um, those fantasy novels. Uh, that was it. Um, just, yeah, j- just couldn't stop reading and haven't stopped since. So, for you at school, were you good at writing? And did school was it did it was it a challenge for you, or were you actually pretty good uh, academically when you were growing up as a young fella? No, Adam, I was a, I was a crap student. I, um, I was good at writing though. And I remember a number of teachers saying to me at the end of the year, the only reason you're going through is because of your creative writing abilities. I was not a good student. I hated school. Um, it was scraping past by the bare minimum all the way through. But writing, I was always good at it. Um, I find I've always found it incredibly easy and I still do Um, that's not to say that I'm good at it at a professional level and it's perfect it's not Um, I'm learning and improving all the time and I I see nothing but faults in my work when I go back and reread it but as far as just producing fictional stories and, and making up stories putting them together and writing like a novel or a characters that comes very easily to me and always has so where did your passion for military history come from? Like obviously, you mentioned that your, your dad 
is a Vietnam veteran. Did it come from him or does it come for, uh, from telling, wanting to tell veteran stories or where does it come from? Originally, probably more from my grandfather, dad's dad. He was a, a captain in the Second World War in, in New Guinea, uh, 106 tank attack. So they were sort of special forces, I guess. Uh, special role, at least in New Guinea, there to destroy tanks. But as we know, the the tanks never got past Milne Bay in New Guinea. So he uh, did other things while he was there. But I never knew my grandfather was in the army or in the war while he was alive. Um, he was a famous author uh, himself, and that's all I knew of him. Uh, it wasn't until sort of after he died that I realised it sort of dawned on me that he'd taken part in that war. And as I looked more into it, um, I remember going to a reunion for, with 106 Tank Attack reunion with Dad and just thinking, I wonder, this was after Pop had died, just wondering whether, what are the chances of me finding one of these blokes? Because there were still lots of them alive then that, that, knew, that knew Pop. So I started talking to them. Every single one of them that I spoke to knew him. And I couldn't believe it. And I said to Dad, um, why do they all know pop and he just laughed he said it's the two i see you dickhead it was the captain who is their boss of course they knew. but oh was he I, I didn't know um and that ignorance about his service and and that made me think more about dad um and how ignorant i was of what he'd been through and i'd, I'd always been interested in history but that sort of got me going on australian history and then um through a mate at work dave spackman i um he, he and I used to talk a lot about um, Victoria Cross recipients and um, Albert Jacker in particular and uh, caught the bug in a pretty big way. Absolutely. So is it something that you look back on now, Michael, that you regret not asking your pop more about his service or was he very reserved and didn't want to open up about his time during the Second World War? Uh, yeah, I do. I do regret that. But I, as far as whether he would have talked about it and was reserved, I honestly don't know because I never, I never spoke to him about it. I didn't even know. And it's interesting um, that him and dad never talked about it. If they did, never in front of us because they were both returned. And I know dad was, well, not treated well by Pop in as far as his, um, I think he was a good dad, but as far as his service, he didn't respect that service in Vietnam. He didn't consider it a real war. And like a lot of, a lot of blokes, uh, the RSL didn't want anything to do with him, um, with any of them. And there's some stories there I can tell you that are pretty unbelievable. But um, so I do regret it, but also I was young and I, I don't, don't know what I would have said to him. But I look as a grown up, I look back now and would have been easy um, to talk to him now but back then it just life isn't like that you get older you know he's just pop and in my work as a metal mounter I work I talk to families military families every day and they're always bringing in medals um, so I court mount medals and restore medals and do replica medals for, for soldiers and police and veterans and their families and it's always the same story that Nobody it seems to be interested at my age. No one was interested until later in life when Anzac Day wasn't what it was now when I was a young man. It wasn't the same thing. It just wasn't talked about. So for you, obviously not talking to your grandfather, like what do you, what do you like with your dad? Do you ask him about his service and is he open up for you? Especially being, I know a lot of Vietnam veterans, they don't talk and they find it very hard because of the way they were treated. How is, how is your dad with you in opening up about his service? Good. Um, but yeah, with a caveat, I, he, dad's, dad had a trauma in Vietnam. Um, which I've never spoken to him about. He doesn't like talking about it, and I respect that. So as far as th that bad incident that occurred to him, um, I've never spoken to him about that, and, and I don't need to. It's, it's, um, it's his story. But like every bloody son of a Vietnam veteran I've ever met in my entire life, they talk to their old man about the funny things, and they're all the Vietnam veterans, World War II, they're all the same. 
and even the young blokes coming through, actually less so the young blokes, I think now, but they, they're happy to talk about the funny things and the stupid things they did. But when it comes to the, the real, the trauma and, and whatnot, um, it's a, it's a clamshell. I just, and I get that. So, and I don't want to push. So dad and dad and I, because the, the money, uh, that the Victoria Cross book raises goes to totally and permanently incapacitated veterans. I spent a lot of time with my dad um, around Anzac Day services within the veteran community a lot of time. So we talk a lot and we talk about the war and stuff a lot, but we just don't talk about his particular story. He's happy to talk about his unit and the history of it, but not his own experience. Which is, I understand, and, you know, it's it's something with veterans that, you know, I, I said it to you when, we, when we've when we had a chat off air that, you know, I approach talking to veterans very differently than how I speak to historians, and, and you, you have to. You, you have to you have to respect the, when you're in the room with them and, and you have to pick up on certain things. There's things that may set them off, and, and I totally understand it, and I tot- it'd be the same for your dad. Absolutely, yeah, and and I've because I have uh, war veterans come through, so I run the business from home, so I have them come through, I, on a daily basis, certain times of years, like hundreds of them. So, and then in my work with TPI Victoria, I I just spend so much time with them, and you're dead right. It's you're just it's a bit guided by them, and I think um, most people, particularly that those people, have pretty good bullshit radars. Um, they they sort you out pretty quickly. Um, and they can they have a way of knowing I mean you just if they want to talk to you they'll talk to you if they don't they don't and that's fine and if you just be yourself and you, you just want to listen um, you know, just people and most of them are, are happy to show the respect that you show them absolutely and it's something that I've learned myself that I asked one of my original veterans who came on two years ago i asked her i said why did you come on the show and she said because adam you care you care about our story you care you're not after a two minute grab and then run off you you genuinely care about sharing our stories and you know telling the future generations of what we've gone through and and it is that's exactly what you've just said you know if you show that you care to veterans they generally give you more than what they would if you don't show them the respect that they're due. Yeah, and it's just it's just being interested in what they've been through and in their story. It just I'm just really interested. It's I find it unbelievable what these people do. I I've never put on a pair of army boots in my life. Um, Dad did, my grandfather did, my great grandfather, my great grandfather, all of them went to war. Um, nobody in my generation, in my family did, which is weird, but it stopped at our generation. Um, and yeah, I'm in awe of it. And I'm interested in not just the VC recipients and the, the big stories, but everybody's story, because um, it, that's the base that the biggest stories stand on. Absolutely. And you, ju- you mentioned before the Victoria Cross Australia Remembers book. How did that come about? And was that the first book that you actually authored and decided to write? No, it wasn't. The f- well, it's the first history book. I'd written probably five novels by that stage. Um, none of them had been terribly successful. Uh, but that came about um, big from a, an obsession with Albert Jacker. Uh, and the Victoria Cross in general, and just frustration that nobody had bothered to do it before properly. Um, there was They Dead Mightily that the War Memorial, I think, put out years ago, but it wasn't... Like, the thing that got me about the way this country talks about the Victoria Cross and remembers their stories, it, no one ever bothered to talk to their families in anything I could find, not not in any real way. And when I set out to do this, and also to take photos and, and find the medals and touch them and get interested and go around and see what impact the award and these people have had on their communities, their families, everybody, no one had ever bothered to do it. And I didn't understand that. Um, and I wanted, I wanted it. It's a book, it's like with any story, it's just, if it's a book that I, a novel that I want to read and no one's written it, well, I'll just write it. <laughs> And that's what this was. I thought, well, I'll do it myself. Um, little did I know how big it would become uh, and, and how difficult it would be, but that, that was that that was fine. But so that was it. So I basically set out to um, so to to photograph 
all 100 Victoria Crosses that have been awarded to Australians, there was 100 at that stage, to, to photograph every statue and monument to those men I could find and to find their graves and to photograph their graves, 96 graves around the world. And that covered 17 countries uh, around the world, places like North Russia, Kenya, Libya, South America, places you wouldn't really associate with Australian service. And it really drew, painted a picture of the, the depth of uh, military service um, that this country has given to the world over the last 120 years or so. And the big thing with, with, it, with the VC book for me was I thought if I could find five or six families to talk to um, about these men, I, I honestly believe that they deserve to be spoken about by somebody who loved them and somebody who knew them, not by me, so I thought if I could find five or six families, that'll really warm the book up and make it something very special. And that was incredibly difficult because there was no um, family association or register and nobody really knew who they were or, or where they were. You've got to remember some of these guys were killed in their teens 120 years ago and didn't have kids. So next to kin might be a great, great, great niece or nephew who didn't know them. And in the end, um, due to the incredible work of uh, volunteers from TPI Victoria, I ended up at getting 60 of the 100 families come forward and I interviewed 60 families for the book. I now know uh, I think probably 95 or 96 of the 101 families personally now. So that was just a very challenging, uh, very, very daunting, but also very rewarding. And it's made something pretty special. So... You mentioned in the book what what as you're writing and and these stories of the men who have received the highest honor what did what common traits did you find when you when you're writing these stories none none that's the unbelievable thing about the victoria cross uh there's only the only thing i can find they seem to have in common is humility that's it uh, there's no background, there's no rank, uh, there's no job, there's no set personality, but they all seem to be humble. And that's a bit of a cliche with VC recipients, um, but I th people tend to walk past it. But if you just unpack it a little bit and think about it, it kind of makes sense because if you're somebody who's not humble and who's not genuine and who is in it for the glory and self-gratification, you're probably not the sort of bloke who's going to get out of a trench and charge down a machine gun post fully expecting to die um, to help somebody, which is generally the sort of thing these people do. So that's the only thing I could honestly say that they seem to have in common is they're all really humble people. Um, and it's if you understand what the Victoria Cross is, a lot of people don't really know what it is, but what, once you understand what it is, um, it, it, it kind of puts it all into perspective. And, and I can explain for people who don't know, if you want. Yeah, please do, mate. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, well, the Victoria Cross was uh, came out of the Crimean War in the 18, uh, in 1856. The Crimean War was a war that that, um, that France and Britain were fighting against Russia in the Crimea. Sounds very familiar today, unfortunately. But during that war, uh, the British didn't have any gallantry awards or... Um, decorations that they could give to enlisted men or NCOs, just the officers. At best, an enlisted man or an NCO could be mentioned in dispatches or promoted in the field, perhaps that was it. And at the same time, a new type of journalist had emerged called a war correspondent who were embedded with the troops and went into the battles of the war zone and were reporting directly back to London about what they'd seen. And it became very apparent to the people at home that the only people getting decorated in this war with, with, with the officers it didn't sit well uh, with people who whose kids were getting killed and their brothers and husbands were getting killed and while they were over there a bloke by the name of Lord Pemure and a few others saw that the French had a medal called the Legion of Honour which they'd give to anybody and it was the highest award they could possibly give and I mean anybody any rank any background there was there, there was no pretense to it and that, he loved that idea and they took that idea to Queen Victoria and she absolutely loved it so they decided to to make a medal along that line so that's where the inspiration came from and the idea uh, for the Victoria Cross um, 
came about and I think most people seem to know I think that the Queen actually got very heavily involved and she changed the wording on the cross from uh, originally it was going to be for the brave she changed it to for valor because she thought that this is the words on the front of the cross because she thought that for the brave suggested that the only brave people in her forces were people with a cross and she thought they were all brave um, and then uh, so a, a, a um, jeweler in London by the name of Hancock's um, coined and designed the cross and uh, sent the prototype to Queen Victoria. And when the aristocrats and the generals and the politicians saw it, they hated it. They thought it was dull, boring and mean and miserable. Queen Victoria absolutely loved it because it was just dull bronze plane she and it speaks to her forward thinking what an unbelievably forward thinking and invested person she was um, she understood that this award was about the person behind the award not the medal the medal's got nothing to do with it. it's about the man and the, and the action and so she basically took that horribly ugly piece of bronze and said I love it just put some little laurel leaves on the top and a V for Victoria and, and that's it. And then they decided to make it from um, bronze from captured cannons, cannons that um, legend tells us Russian cannons captured at the Battle of Sebastopol. That's not true. Um, they, they, were, they, they, were, they are made from cannons, but they're not Russian cannons. And they, from best I can work out, were never anywhere near Sebastopol. They were captured from somewhere else. Um, they're actually Chinese cannons that were being used by the Russians during that war. So the Victoria Cross is actually made in China. So um, I guess you could say. So there you go. So, but anyway, um, that, that's, that's where it came from. And uh, that's where the history kicked off. So it was a little bit different. And it was, it was decided that it would be given only by the, by the Queen or the monarch of the day. Nobody else can award it. That stands to this day. It's, it's the monarch's decision. Nobody else, no politicians, no generals, no governor generals. The Queen decides who gets a Victoria Cross to this very day, even the Victoria Cross of Australia, all of them. And um, it, again, there's one last point just to put it into perspective how big this award is. Um, when you're awarded the Victoria Cross, you get the post anonymous VC after your name, no matter what else you do in your life, uh, you could be knighted, a PhD, a Nobel Prize, nothing comes before VC. It is always first. It is the highest award on the planet, period. And when I went to Hancock's in London, I was lucky enough to be invited to Windsor Castle by the Queen to go in and hold that prototype. I actually got to hold it when I was writing the book and she let me into the vault where they keep the metal that the VCs are made from. Um, and my Gordon Trail and I were the only, still the only Australians ever in there to hold it. And when I spoke to Hancock's, and this puts it all into perspective, uh, he said, he, this, the, the Stoke director guy, Burton, who actually engraves the Victoria Crosses when they're awarded, he said, when he pulls one of these unissued Victoria Crosses out of the drawer, they're worth about $5, five Australian dollars. The moment he turns them around and engraves a bloke's name on the back, they're instantly worth a million bucks. If you want an example of Queen Victoria's forward thinking, working in real time, there it is. It, it just puts it all in a nutshell. So that, that's a very abbreviated version of the, of the Victoria Cross and what it is, it's unbelievable history and, um, and, and why it's so important. So amazing. Like I'm just sitting here listening to that and Michael and just, you know, you being able to go in and see the prototype and, you know, like go to London and, and speak to, you know, Hancock's over there and, and the jewelers and, and made unbelievable. Like just, uh, it's like you said, and really forward thinking by Queen Victoria. It's the, and I've often said this too, and I'm glad you mentioned it. That the, I look at the Victoria Cross and I go, it is a dull metal. It's a very dull, it's a very, you know, it's very plain, but it's, as you said, it's, it's the men, it's the, the men who are awarded these Victoria crosses. It's their stories behind how they have, how they've been awarded these medals and absolutely forward thinking by Queen Victoria. Yeah. When I was at Windsor Castle, uh, they said to me that the Queen had given me permission to use Queen Victoria's diaries in my book. Um, I didn't know she had diaries. So after I sort of picked myself up off the floor and said, oh, wow, <laughs> I, uh, turns out that you, 
could only access them through on the online in the UK and we were there on charity money. So I had to, we were shooting and um, filming and interviewing people during the day. So I had to go back to my hotel room and read her diaries every night. And it was just looking for any reference to the Victoria Cross that I could find. And during that time, uh, I really sort of got an understanding of who she was. Every day, she would write about men, sailors and soldiers that were being killed or wounded and how she'd meet them and she'd meet their families. And you remember, this is her diaries. No one, she never knew anybody was going to read this. And by going through it and reading it, it, she really cared. It really affected her, Um, you know, learning about these men and talking to their families it's so clear from her diaries how much it affected her and that I think that impact really focused her attention on 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 the cross and making sure that it was done properly and she bloody well did and it's a you as you said it's you know when when it's pulled out of the drawer it's five dollars and then when the name is inscribed it then it jumps dramatically to more than a million dollars and they're they are a sought after item now like they they really are and and yeah absolutely forward thinking so when you're writing the book what story of the like you mentioned albert jacker and was there any any other world war one and world war two stories that stood out to you when you were writing the book yeah martin o'meara um really got to me he uh so you got to remember this book is a work of charity. I don't take a cent from this and neither does the publisher, Big Sky Publishing. And I can tell you as an author, publishers don't do that. <laughs> they, they've done this at cost. So every cent from this book goes to TPI Victoria. That is a totally and permanently incapacitated veterans, uh, ex-service persons association in the Victoria. The only reason I did this is to help dad so he could have some money to have a beer with his mates. <laughs> That's really um, what it all started from. And um, that Martin O'Meara's story ties in with that in a tragic way and a really, really important way. If when people, when you get the book, um, that there's a window, there's a window on the front that that opens that opens up to the front page, and there's a Victoria Cross on the front page of the book, um, full picture of the Victoria Cross. That is Martin O'Meara's actual Victoria Cross. So I went to Perth and I got to hold it, and there's a reason that VC is in the front of the book. And that is because of what happened to Martin after the war. He is known as one of the finest soldiers we had in World War I. He was unbelievable and a bit of a pacifist. Um, I don't know how true this is, but there's a lot of a, a lot of people say that he never fired a shot. Um, he didn't like to carry a gun. I don't know how true that is. I, there's definitely truth to it. Um, he, he definitely didn't like the idea of killing people. And his Victoria Cross was at Posiers of all places, in about the hell. You know, like you, you imagine a million shells landing in a day, you know. Um, over a period of three or four days, he went out under fire, just raining artillery and 20,000 Australians killed very quickly. He went out over and over and over again over a period of four days to bring people in who'd been wounded um, just over and over. And he's bringing ammunition forward and backwards, dragging them on stretches on his own. It wasn't a stretcher bearer, but he acted like one. It's just incredible. And he's finally pretty badly wounded. He's wounded three times. Anyway, he survived. Now, he was an Irish boy born in Ireland uh, in Tripperary, just close to where my family comes from. So he came back to um, Australia, but you've got to realise that uh, Ireland was a very different place in 1916, 1917. So he'd, he'd been, he really wasn't welcome, he thought, in Ireland because he'd been decorated by the enemy, the enemy being the British. He wasn't really welcome in the UK because he was the enemy. He was, he was an Irishman. The only place he did feel at home was Australia, where he'd come. He'd working in Perth before the war, and he joined the 16th Battalion. So he came back under quite a bit of pressure, by the way, from the Australian government to help with the conscription. He came back to Australia, and there's an there's a newspaper article, uh, an interview with him, done by the Western Australian, um, and it, it's titled "Under Any Gum Tree," which they asked him where are you living? Because he was homeless at the time. He said, under any gum tree. Within a few days, I think, or weeks of that interview, and in the interview, he's funny, he's coherent, 
Um, he sounds intelligent. He had a mental breakdown after that and he never recovered from it. Um, and that, that is an understatement. He spent the last 17 years of his life in an insane asylum. Uh, he was suicidal and homicidal um, to the point of um, hearing and vision, so hallucinating. He was hyper violent. Uh, he was, he tried to damage, like he'd spend up to 20 hours a day in a straitjacket. And because he couldn't hurt himself at one stage, he bit the end of his tongue off. He was so determined to hurt himself. And in the end, after 17 years, this is a, this is a Victoria Cross recipient. 17 years of being in, in, incarcerated, basically, in the Claremont uh, Insane Asylum. He fretted himself to death. And this is a tree cutter, a powerful 50-year-old man, um, was so stressed that he, 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 he died. Um, and I got to know his, his family, his niece, and um, I got involved with getting his Victoria Cross returned to Ireland, which is another story. Um, but the, the importance of this story, um, where, where it ties into the TPI Association and what we try to do, obviously the TPI veterans are by nature some of the most needy uh, that there is because they are totally and permanently incapacitated from their service. They can never work again. But so Martin's story was obviously very important to us. And I got his niece to actually write a bit of a, um, a warning at the start of his story because it is graphic and it is extremely important. And it just shows that if this can happen to a Victoria Cross recipient of his ilk, um, one of the finest and bravest men ever seen on the field of battle, if he can come apart at the seams so utterly, well, it can happen to anybody. And if you're feeling that way, um, you know, obviously not, not to those extremes, but if you're feeling the anxiety and stress and, and the PTSD and the other things that comes with military service and other things, you know, it, it doesn't mean that you're not, you're not a good person or that there's something wrong with you. Um, it is serious and it needs to be taken extremely seriously because the con consequences don't bear thinking about. Such a... It, Martin's story is, yeah, it's a story that I've read and I, I often, every time I read it, Michael, I often cry because, you know, you, you see such a, a man of, you, you know, such bravery, such, you know, and like you said, which I, I learn off you that, you know, a bit of a, bit of a pacifist didn't want to, didn't really want to fight, didn't really want to get a gun, but when it came to when it came to the crunch, he would do everything in his power to to you know and to go out and help wounded and drag ammunition up and just it's it's a story that yeah every time I read it I just I see the demise of what what war does and and you know there's no winners of war and and Martin's story is one of those stories that you just yeah it's you can't help but shed a tear when you when you read and you know i've gone through especially for me world war one is such a it's such an interest of mine and i've been to the western front four times and and reading his story and reading the victoria cross stories and seeing the headstones like you know you see like frederick tubb his story and you know such a, a decorated soldier as well at gallipoli and then dying on the western front and and there's captain jeffries and they're all these men they're just it's an amazing they're amazing men that what they did and it's just yeah martin's story is just one that is just so sad it is. And it's, it's a story of, um, you know, when we, I, I get asked a lot by media and, and people when I do, I do a lot of public speaking and, and it's an inevitable question, you know, do you have a favourite Victoria Cross action? Um, at first, I didn't want to uh, answer it because I thought it was kind of just asking for trouble and politically correct. But the reality is I do, um, but different types, you know, you've got your Fats McCarthy and your Albert Jackers, you know, guys that, went over the top and like Fats McCarthy was called the super VC where he ran across 400 meters of barbed wire and took out three or four machine gun pillboxes single handedly destroyed them, killed the crew one after the other and went into the last one and captured 50 Germans single handedly with a pistol. And it was such a staggering 
uh, uh, event that the Germans he captured literally car when he when he captured them and carried them back to the they took them back to the lines they put him on their shoulders and carried him back as a hero the Germans that he captured is unbelievable and then you've got other ones like um, you know Martin's where he's just trying to help people he wasn't out to kill anybody he's just trying to help his mates and then Frank McNamara bloody hell um, what an unbelievably I won't go on but Frank McNamara's so he was our only pilot from World War One. bloody hell if you'd written that story in a comic book which they actually turned it into a comic book nobody would believe it it's so dramatic it's so unbelievable it's just awesome it's really cool like what he did and again just trying to save a mate and um really dramatic and then bloody dasher dasher wheatley geez um is you just when you get down into the mud and the humility and the self-sacrificing and just sticking by your mates his story is just unbelievable Absolutely. You've just mentioned Dasha. And so it's a great way to bring in Dasha's story. So you you continued after writing the Victoria Cross Australia Remembers, you then go on to write the Kevin Wheatley VC story. Has that for you, how did this come about? And, and what was your interest in telling Dasha's story? Well, when I so I said earlier, when I started the VC book and I was looking for VC families, George Wheatley, Dash's son, was the very first person to approach me. Um, I actually had no backing at the start, so I did a crowdfunding project and George saw what I was doing and that would be a work of charity. And he he um, donated a little bit of money, well, quite a bit actually. Um, and he was really um, enthusiastic and encouraging. And that was surprising because I thought, I was really scared of what the families would say that that they'd be like oh, another bloody author or whatever coming through and you know trying to make a buck off our dad or which I wasn't trying to do but and, and by the way nothing could be further from the truth I didn't get any of that um, but George and George told me that I wouldn't you know he he really gave me the confidence um, and the belief that what I was doing was really important not just to raise money for the veterans but this book needed to be written. This needed to be done properly. Um, the research needed to be done. Um, the boxes needed to be to be checked. So I, I got to know George through that. He was the first family. His was the first family I got involved with, and I got to know his mum Edna, and I just love Edna. She's, which Edna's Dash's widow, obviously. Um, and then after the VC book came out, they just encouraged me and supported me all the way through. And then with George and I always spoke about. Um, all the authors and the failed attempts of writing a book about Dasha. No one's ever managed to do it before for various reasons, um, which is staggering because it's such a wildly entertaining story. Um, it, it, and he's one of our most famous Victoria Cross recipients of all time. The only person I can think of that would people know more is Jacka, probably. Um, everybody seems to know him. Apart from Jacka, honestly, if you don't, everybody knows who he is and, and particularly in the military and nobody had bothered to write a book about him before. So we talked about it and um, ended up deciding to do it. And uh, it was something that I was a bit frightened about, to be honest, because of um, the story and you're writing about somebody's, somebody's husband, somebody's dad, uh, somebody's brother and who died tragically. And it's hard. And somebody who is held in enormous regard by better people than me, you know, really good special forces people that fought with him and, and, and were trained by him, quality people hold him on such a pedestal. Pedestal. I'm like, well, who the hell am I to do this? But it turned out I was the only one who could because I had the knowledge of the Victoria Cross, the connections I needed and the family's trust. The family trusted me and they would let me do it and they would speak to me particularly Edna um, she doesn't really do interviews or anything like that but um, I get along well with Edna I've got a lot of respect for her and she was happy for me to do it and to help out so that's how it um, that's how it sort of came about and I sat down to do it um, ended up writing it during lockdown and having to do most of the interviews um, over Skype and, and that sort of stuff which is challenging but um, bloody rewarding it's an incredible story so 
where did the name Dasher come from? Came from uh, his rugby days. So he was a very famous footballer, rugby football, um, bef- before Vietnam. So he, Dasher was a he was a everybody thinks because he was held in such awe everyone pitches him as a 40 50 year old warrant officer he was a warrant officer he was only 28 when he was killed but he'd been to malaya um he'd been to png as a um platoon sergeant training men and he was very well known because he'd been in all four battalions at the stage it was one two three and four he'd been in all of them particularly one RAR they absolutely loved him and he played football mostly for one RAR and when he'd go and play um, they'd all go and watch him and he was one of the best in the country he seriously was there's I found rumors uh, fairly substantial rumors that were some very big clubs that were, that were offering him contracts I couldn't really substantiate it though so it didn't go in the book but I do believe it um, he played with some good men he was as hard as they came and, you, and he was fast. He wasn't a big man. He was at five foot six, five foot seven, I think. Um, but gee, he didn't want to get in his way. So in the book, you talk about Dash's childhood and the effects on the family as a result of his father's World War II experiences. Could you discuss a bit about this and how much of this do you think ultimately shaped and prepared him to become a tough soldier that he was? His dad uh, served in Africa in World War II and came back clearly, clearly suffering um, from PTSD, no doubt. I mean, I've never met the man, but you talk to the family and it's, obvi- it's obvious being the son of a veteran and, and um, being from one of those families, he was suffering. Um, and Bob didn't cope with it well. And he was violent. He stabbed Asher at one stage, had a fight and actually stabbed him. Um, so he would have he he would have wanted Dasher to join the army. He certainly wanted Dasher's older brother Doc to join the army. He he dropped out of school to join the army. Uh, he had to get his dad's permission to do it. His Dasher's mum Poppy she didn't want didn't want him to join the army. She wanted him to stay at school. But Dasher's dad signed the paperwork to let him in um, behind his mother's back um so obviously pushed the i don't know, pushed him into it but opened the door for him let him into it and he was actually killed in a training accident in um Pacapanyol, tragically um which just destroyed his mum obviously absolutely destroyed her so i mean all that when you think a few years later dasha did the same thing uh he he joined the army um his mum his poor mum she can't have been happy about that um but and, and I'm pretty sure I know why he did it, but um, it, certainly his dad's experiences would have given him something, I don't know, m- maybe a sense of adventure and the naive things we think when we think about our dad's going to war. And um, certainly his treatment would have hardened him up, that's for sure. Not not saying that that's how you should treat your kids, but it, 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 obvious, it obviously did. So you mentioned that Dasher joined the army in 1956. What what he what led him to join the army after after lose, seeing his father's you know the, the the brutality from his father and and his father's wartime experiences and then obviously you mentioned his brother being killed in in the tragic accident in Pakapanyul. What led him to join the army? Money. Um, he, he was very young. He had a young, young wife. Um, he had left school early to work with his dad, actually. It's where he met, um, Edna. So it's a great story too. That's so cute. The way they met, it's beautiful. Um, and he was struggling to provide, um, a good, reliable career where he could have reliable money and grown up money real grown-up money for his family and be a good dad and the only thing he knew that would offer that uh, was the army so I'm pretty sure and and again this this is from you know his family Um, so that's why he did it to support his family for for reliable income and a reliable job it's that simple. So what was the Australian army like in those days and what was going on around the world for Australia to go overseas on operations? So this is during, you know, the, when the Cold War was really ramping up 
yeah, with the Americans and the and the USSR, and communism was slithering its way through Asia down towards Australia, and there was a lot of fear and hatred of communism. The army itself was rebuilding and restructuring, uh, trying to adopt an American sort of style, uh, like it was called pentropic, where they'd be more. Um, I think they had went from four to six battalions and they wanted to be more um, capable of being moved by air, um, upgrading their weapons. So he would have spent a lot of his time um, in and around, I think it would have been after he deployed to Malaya, um, training and, and doing, doing training exercises to try and get this pentropic system going to find out the flaws in it. So he would have spent, uh, they all would have spent a lot of time on that but um in the end it kind of failed and they sort of went back to the four battalion tropic system but they did keep some aspects of it from but i'm not an expert on on that part of um, the military so what was dash's time like in malaya did he have a good experience and that would set him up later for what his experiences would be like in vietnam crucial so you gotta this is one of the big things that i got from um Bill Williams and a few of the other blokes that um, that served with Dasher and that he trained. What Dasher was with three RAR in Malaya, and he was he went over there with a bloke. One of his his CO was a bloke by the name of Maka Mackay. Maka uh, received the military medal for bravery in the field on the Kokoda track with the famous 39th Battalion. So you you that they're the people that trained him these real old school, bloody hard as nails men who'd gone hand to hand with the Japanese on the Kokoda track, decorated people, very, very good at jungle warfare, skilled, hard fighters. They were the ones who trained him. They were the ones who took him to Malaya and it was the same fight over there. It was jungle. It was horrible. He actually worked as a dog, uh, dog handler for, for a time over there. Um, and the whole family went, Edna went over and took, uh, took her two kids and actually her third child was born in Malaya um, and then uh, they sort of had to come back in a hurry but uh, you certainly from what I could gather it, it's hard to to get any real background story of what he actually went through but there's certainly some evidence that he was involved in some significant contacts and from some books that I found he he handled himself pretty well. So Dasher was a well, you've mentioned, you know, he served in three RAR, so one, two, three, four RAR, and he was a well-respected sergeant in one RAR. Can you share with us some of the stories of how he came to be so well-known and so well-respected? Yeah, so his, his infamy came from the footy field mostly, um, but there was a, when he became platoon sergeant, uh, he he was given his platoon and they, they, were, they were named the Scungies because he wouldn't let them bathe because <laughs> and whenever they'd walk into a room, they'd stink so much they picked up the, the name Scungies because he really pushed them. And he famously said to them, look, you know, one day you're going to have to do this for real. Get used to it. And he really pushed them. And that's I think that Scungies name stuck for a long time. Uh, so and he also took them uh, as platoon sergeant to PNG up in New Guinea just before they went to Vietnam. That, this is one RAR. And again, everybody knew him. He was a platoon sergeant by this stage. Very, very famous. Very well loved. He was also well known in the in the civvy world because uh, there was a pub in Sydney um, uh, where he, he would frequent and he was well known for keeping the peace there and, and being a bit of a larrikin and a lad. So everyone knew him. And one of the things, one of the blokes told me, it was Bill Williams, actually. Um, so one of the things that he passed on to them, it doesn't sound like much, but there's this grass in Southeast Asian jungles, like a, this elephant grass. It's If you try and push through it, it'll just cut you to pieces and then you end up getting open sores and infection and all sorts of stuff. And one of the things that they were able to teach, this is a great metaphor for the way the army works too, is that he, he taught them very simply, rather than going through side by side, you go through single file, the person in front takes the blade to the grass, turns around, hands it to the bloke behind him who takes it, hands it to the person behind him, hands it to the person behind him, and you all go through, no problem, nobody gets hurt. And that is a great metaphor for the way that the Australian army has built 
and, and works for, as far as I can tell, in that these men who trained Dasher, these blokes from the Kokoda track, who were trained by the blokes in Gallipoli, all this wealth of knowledge was, was given to them and passed down. And Dasher passed that down to the men of 1RAR and because he was way more experienced. He was very young, but he was very, very well experienced. And he taught them a lot about how to keep their, their guns dry in that climate, which definitely saves some of their lives. You know, how to shit safely, all the silly little things that you... Um, you're not going to really learn until you've been out there and done it for real. And the trip to PNG was crucial for that. In fact, when they came back, 1RAR was the first battalion to deploy to Vietnam um, and they never went through Kapuka, the only ones who didn't, because they were considered battle ready because they'd just been deployed to PNG and trained by Dasher and um, came back and they were sent straight across. So Dasher volunteered to join the Australian Army training team, the AATTV. Can you tell us what the AATTV's role was in Vietnam and how Dasher would, how he performed? Over, well, we know how he performed, but can you just tell us what their role was over there? Yeah, it was a very strange unit. It it's, um, should be known, it needs to be stated, that the AATTV is the most highly decorated unit in Australian military history, period. Four Victoria Crosses, a staggering amount of gallantry awards. Um, it's unbelievable what those people achieved. Um, and it was primarily a training unit um, that was there to advise. They were, they were known as advisors. Literally, that's what they called each other. Uh, so there's a lot of misconceptions about some of them who were killed and some like Dash's action and some things that went wrong that, you know, oh, they should have done this and this was a bad mistake. People don't understand that the, these men really didn't have much of a say. The South Vietnamese were in charge. They were there to advise them. And they, they could advise stringently, <laughs> violently maybe, but they couldn't force the South Vietnamese to listen to them and to take their orders. So that was basically their role, was to tra train up the, the South Vietnamese military and get them ready to fight um, off their own bat and to, to do things properly. And it, that proved to be unbelievably difficult and dangerous. One of the, the big differences, I think, between those blokes and others is, you know, the army, obviously never, never been in the army. I have played footy and, and I know what a team environment is like. And they are obviously alpha male team environments, especially in those days where you be around with your mates, big groups of men mucking around, going out, looking out, looking out for each other. The AATTV's life was very different in Vietnam in that they'd be out on patrol in Dash's circumstances where he'd be the only Australian. Certainly when he was in the North on the last day, there was only a couple of others with him. He was primarily, primarily with South Vietnamese soldiers and American Marines. And so they didn't have that, that group of men around them that, that, brotherhood that they were used to so it could be very 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 lonely for these guys because none of them spoke English so obviously none of their team members speak English so if if the, the advisor didn't speak South uh, speak Vietnamese then he had to rely on interpreters to communicate and you can imagine how lonely that would have been especially for somebody like Dash Dasha who was the life of the party um, he was always the most popular and loved person in the room. He'd light up any room he walked into. So, and I think clearly towards the end, he was, we, we can see that he was feeling that. So it was a very, very dangerous, very lonely and extremely difficult job uh, for those men. It's something similar that I recently listened to a podcast with Dan Curran VC and he Stated in, you know, working with the Afghan army and how, you know, it, the the language barrier and, and Dasha had the same, you know, the language barrier of, of trying to get men into position and, and it would be a challenge. And, and, I, and in the book, when I was reading it, it was... You could see it that, you know, there was times where, where Dasher was frustrated with, you know, like you could see it in your writing. You could see he was frustrated by, he's like, just, I want you to do this and just do that. And it's, it, why won't, it's pretty, pretty basic things to do as a, but 
he's not with his Australian mates beside him that would that would do that. So yeah, it would be a challenge. It would be a very it would have been a challenging role. Yeah, and you have to understand that the South Vietnamese Army, um, so um, and, and he, so he was with two different units. He, he spent most of his time in the far north uh, with the, um, the South Vietnamese Army, and then he moved south to be with the um, uh, civil uh, irregular group, the the Montagnards, the Mountain People. The particularly the South Vietnamese Army, the proper one, that had very different politics to ours. They they would go out of their way to avoid a fight. So to, they, they found it incredibly difficult to recruit people, whereas the VC, the Viet Cong, found it very easy. So um, if, if a, a South Vietnamese officer was to go out and get a whole bunch of his men killed, he could be court-martialed and executed. So um, they didn't want to fight. That, so, and that, that caused all sorts of problems because it was not in their interest to get in a fight. So they would literally deliberately leak intelligence to the Viet Cong, not because they wanted them to kill them, because they wanted to give an opportunity to piss off, to let them know that we're coming, piss off. And, and they would. And it created all sorts of problems because they'd go out on a patrol and the VC would already know they were coming um, and they would leave and obviously leave booby traps and snipers along the way, which wreaked havoc on them. So unbelievably frustrating for, you know, from the Australian mindset that, that, that one of the operations in there uh, where his good friend, Captain Mon was killed, uh, Lieutenant Mon was killed, where they, um, you know, I think I talk about where they, uh, they got to a village and when they got there, the VC were gone and, you know, the Dasher and the Americans, the American Marines are very, very good soldiers. Um, they must have found that very frustrating because had they been in charge, there's no way the VC would have known they were coming and they would have destroyed them. They would, but they would have suffered casualties because the VC were no mugs, especially if you ran into the NVA and there was a lot of North Vietnamese regular army around that part of the country as well. And they ran into them all the time. So you'd get killed. So you go in, yeah, you achieve the objective, you take the, um, you, you wipe out this particular company you're trying or you capture these supplies or but you get a few people killed and for the Australians and the Americans it's tragic but it's acceptable for the South Vietnamese it would not be acceptable so completely different politics and it made it extremely hard so can you share with us Michael some of Dash's experiences in action while he was in Vietnam yeah there's there's some really famous ones um the first really big one was, um, which a lot of people know about, was where he, he saved a little girl. So he was, uh, his, his company, he was with 1-1, were out um, searching for a battalion of uh, Viet Cong, as was another company. And the other company um, of the Arvin, Dash's men, had found this battalion and was pushing them south and Dash had got his men into place and stopped them. Unfortunately, they that when they closed on this battalion and started destroying it, um, it happened in a, a little hamlet and they tried their best to get everybody out and the battle started. And the the other company, so the Arvin, the South Vietnamese, at the, at the other side of the battlefield set up some Bren guns, some 50 calibre machine guns and started firing into this village to destroy the VC, which is a bit silly because Dash's men were completely on the other side of the village downrange and as most people know, a, a hut or a human body does not stop a 50 caliber round. A tree probably isn't going to stop it. So these huge rounds were falling into Dash's position. It was just a nightmare. Um, and but they were destroying the battalion. And, and um, a long story short, a, um, a family was still in the village and the mother sort of ran towards Dasher for cover. And her, she had a four-year-old girl with her as well as other kids. And the kid freaked out and stopped in the middle of the road. And there was two 50 caliber machine guns, dozens and dozens of small arms, a huge battle around, people dying everywhere. And this little girl was caught right in the middle of it, right in the middle of the fire. And she was done for. And Dasher got up, he charged right out into the middle of it, right out in the open. And he wrapped his, his body around her. And, um, he protected her with his body and picked her up. And I've got a little girl, so, you know, it's, it's emotional. And, you know, he brought her back to to her, um, to her mum and, and he <laughs> went back to fighting. And everybody in his company saw that. 
you know, he should have been killed. That was absolute suicide for him to do that, but, but he did it. Um, and it, it really, from what I can gather, really motivated his men. It's unbelievably brave. Uh, he was um, decorated, um, of course, for that by the, um, beg your pardon, he, he, was, he was recommended for a decoration for that by the Australian government. Um, but it never came through, which I go into uh, in the book. And then there's the action for which he was recommended for another one. Uh, it's the Silver Star action in the book where he uh, led a bayonet charge, basically a one-man bayonet charge up a slope uh, towards a full battalion of VC who had the higher ground who were planning a counterattack, and he destroyed them. Um, he killed five, six or seven of them at least, um, and saved his mate, Jim Lowe, a lieutenant in the Marine Corps. Um, he saved his life in a very dramatic way, um, Hollywood style way. It was, it was incredible. It was so close to a Victoria Cross action, that was. Um, I've actually found, we found, with Dash's son, we found a document from the Queen's um, secretary saying um, that this action deserves a DCM at least probably a Victoria Cross. Um, we've got letters from the from the Yanks, from the Americans, insisting that the Australians give him the highest award possible for that. Of course, like with the girl, we didn't give him anything. Um, the Americans tried to give him a silver star, but the Australians had a bizarre policy at this stage of not allowing service people to wear foreign awards. So for 56 years, the Americans tried to award Dasher a silver star. And when I uh, was writing the book, the time we published it, that still hadn't happened um, for various frustrating reasons. But can, I can tell you, I think I did tell you off. Um, before we that was the other day when we were talking that um, just before Christmas last year, so the end of 2021, we went to Canberra with the family to the American embassy and they finally gave his family Dash's silver star after 56 years. Um, so we now need to go back to the drawing board and we've got some good people working on it to try and get those two. So he's still to, owed two Australian awards for those actions. So we're going to try and we're going to try and get those issued as well, which is going to be very, very difficult, but we'll try. I'm glad you, when you, I'm glad you choked up a bit, Michael, with when he, when Dasha ran out to get that little girl. It's, I think it's, it's like anything that a parent would do, would, you know, and, and Dasha being a, a father himself. And, and I, like I'm not a father, but I've I've recently my little niece has been born, and holding her, Michael, I I only I I know what it'll be like when I do have kids, but I only ever want to protect her, and and I can see exactly why you choked up, and it's something that every father would do. That Dasha just did what any father would do, and. Mate, I'm glad you did choke up, and it shows the emotion of, you know, it's it just such bravery to do what he did. Like, absolute suicide. Oh, it's, but when you know his character, it, it's not surprising because he loved kids over there. He, he, he um, he, cheeky bugger. He, he, whenever he'd go into a village, he'd have his pockets full of chocolates and candies and soap, and he told all the kids the South Vietnamese kids in the hamlets and villages to call him Ned Kelly because uh, he thought it was cool. And they did. So you can imagine this Australian, he was always on point leading his men into a village or a hamlet and they all knew him. And all these little kids had come running out, Ned Kelly, Ned Kelly, Ned Kelly. And he'd give, he'd, he'd, he'd trade weapons and cigarettes and things to buy chocolates and sweets and soaps. And he'd hand them out to these kids. Um, he's very well known for it. Um, so, you know, and it's one of the, really strange dualities of him he was a very complicated character um, but he certainly loved kids and um, yeah it, like I said that was witnessed by so many people and had a huge impact on his men absolutely and it's mate he he just he he just seems to be like the the larrikin the larrikin Aussie you know that that we all know and love like that he's just that that you know, she'll be right, mate. Like, you know, she'll be right. The attitude of she'll, whatever happens, she'll be right. Oh, was he ever? Yeah. He was, he was, um, 
the duality of him was striking because he was, I think I said to the other day, picture Shane Warne and Albert Jacker. That's kind of what he was like because he was always the life of the party, always leading the drinking and the fun. And But um, so as soon as he walked into it, everyone will tell, it's something I think I said to you too. Whenever I, I give the book, because it's got a picture of Dasher on the front of it, to somebody who knew him, it's always the same response. They, they see it, they see his face on the cover and their face lights up with a big grin. Oh, bloody Dasher, every one of them. And then this cloud comes over them, you know, and it's, you can see the pain when they recall what happened. Yeah, he was so well loved, but that was it, his ability to be such an idiot <laughs> when it was appropriate to be an idiot to, to, and there was method to that, you know, he, he was, he was good at lifting morale and, and really having a good time and making people be happy to be around him but the moment he stepped out beyond the wire he changed and this is something a few of the men who were with him spoke about that was incredible he just switch off where i think it's a it's a um challenge young veterans probably have today where they can be deployed overseas and maybe skyping or facetiming with their kids or their wife one minute and then out past the wire hunting hunting the enemy the next and what if your wife has just told you you're on the other side of the planet that your kid's fallen off a trampoline and broken her arm or god knows well you can't pay that something has happened at home you can't be thinking about that when you're out on patrol you have to be focused and that's not possible for most human beings it's not reasonable and it's not fair um dasha didn't have that problem he could he just switch gears and when he was out beyond the wire he was perfect and i mean perfect he was absolutely staggering. Everybody who served with him say he is the best soldier they had ever seen. And one of the greatest, if not the greatest, this country has ever produced. And God knows what he would have achieved had he not did what he did that day. And it's, you you talk about, like, you've just spoken about modern day soldiers and, and you know, there's, there's some that are just, like, I had Cam Baird. VC, I had Doug's Cam's father on the podcast, and he and you speak to like I've spoken to Cam, a couple of Cam's mates who served with him in the regiment, and Cam's story is very, you know, he he was very similar to that. Like he he was just a a soldier, soldier, and Albert Jacker, same. Some of these some of these men are just soldier, soldiers. They you know they just. They can just switch to being like soldiering. They were meant to be soldiers. That was what they were meant to, you know. And some of the blokes that I've spoken to in Cam's, you know, in Cam's company were, they said he was a warrior. That that was what Cam and and Dasher is so he's the same. He is he was he was a warrior that you know could like you said could just be the be the larrikin the dickhead that you know and and I mean that in the the utmost respect the you know. Oh, yeah, he was. And, and, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. when he went out, when he went outside the wire, he was. It was all professional. He was. He was the soldier, and that Perfect. was what he was. And yeah. just yeah, Cameron's Cameron's story is very similar, isn't it? it very, very similar. It is. It, it's yeah. very the football, the age, the leadership, yep. the self sacrifice. It's incredible. It is very, and that's when you were te- when you were just saying that. I'm I, Cam's came straight into my head. I was like, yeah, no, I'm hearing. Dasher, Cam, like Albert Jacker, I'm hearing these names and mate, soldiers, soldiers. That's that's what they that's what these guys are. Soldiers, soldiers. And and it's in the book you talk about you talk about Dasher's little mate, Herbert. Can you can you tell us a story about Herbert? Yeah, Herbert. Um I've got photos to back this up. This is true. Um <laughs> <laughs> there was a he had a little he had a little mate, um, in Quang Tri, uh, by the name of Herbert, it was named after one of his mates, and Herbert was a duck. And whenever, just a wild duck, whenever Dasher was um, back at back at base, the duck would come waddling in and sort it, and come looking for him. And they became good mates. And whenever Dasher went out on patrol, sometimes for weeks on end, the duck would disappear. He'd come back, and the duck would know. Oh, this photos of him with it. Um, he used to get it drunk. And there's a famous story um, that Jim Lowe told, actually, the, the American, um, who was 
very close to Dasha in um, in Vietnam in the first five months um, of a they were at the bar and um, there was a American colonel who just put, been put in charge of the base who wasn't wasn't endearing himself to the Australians. Let's just say that he wasn't well liked. And he walked into the bar and I won't spoil the story, but um, uh, uh, well, <laughs> Herbert ended up shitting down the front of his perfectly pressed uniform and, and um, making an absolute <laughs> fool out of him. So um, like everything about the man was, was, was either a joke or just perfect soldiering. It's just such a bizarre story. And um it's just his ability to, you can imagine a distraction like that, you know, like a pet duck and everyone has a joke about it, you know, well, warn your mates, if you try and eat this duck, I'm going to kill you. You know, um, those sort of distractions for the men must have been very useful, I think, because the stress they would have been under, uh, especially the AATTV guys, it have been enormous. So to come back and have these stupid things, um, they could joke about and have a little bit of fun, you know. Uh, I think that was really important. A hundred percent. And I think another another story that you tell in the book and it, and it sums Dash's character up was the moment with Gunny Sharp. Can you tell us about this story? And this this really, for me in the book, when I was reading it, Michael, this really affected me and just showed me the true character of, of Dasher. And if you can, please share this story. I think it's really important for the listeners. Yeah, so Dasher became very, very close. His first five months were at Quang Trai um, in the, the far north of South Vietnam, uh, where he he worked with the Marine Corps in the Arvin, which is the South Vietnamese Army. And he became very, very close to um, Lieutenant Jim Lowe, in the Marine Corps and a uh, sergeant by the name of Gunny, Gunny Sharp, so Jim Sharp. So Jim was a, a black uh, Marine who had was a sniper in the Korean War and had been awarded the Silver Star for gallantry. A very, very, very good soldier, according to Dasha and Jim Lowe, one of the best they had ever seen. Just a brilliant soldier. But of course, they had segregation, the Americans, uh, during the Vietnam War, which of course the Australians didn't, which meant that being a black man, he couldn't drink in the bars with everybody else. And of course, to Dasha, um, this just was just the height of stupidity. You know, um, it just didn't obviously didn't make any sense to him. Didn't compute. He probably didn't even think about the fact that Jim was black. He, from what I can gather, and Jim's still alive, by the way. Um, he, he's he's not well. He's got dementia at the moment. Um, Jim Sharp, Jim Lowe has died recently, um, but uh, in the last few years. But Jim Sharp is still alive, and he told this story to Dash's daughter. Um, they they'd been out on a horrible patrol where their new um, their new lieutenant, a South Vietnamese guy by the name of Long, had been shot and killed, and him and Jim Lowe, uh, Jim Sharp were quite close and he was really upset so dasher got back and and obviously noticed that jim was was not doing too well so he being dasher the only way that you can fix a a broken heart or a sad bloke is to fill him full of piss so he just said mate let's go let's go and, let's go and get drunk and of course jim laughed and said mate i can't i'm you know i'm black i can't drink in the same bars you do of course dasher just didn't didn't <laughs> didn't consider that a thing at all. We just never heard anything so bloody ridiculous in his life. He said, "Bullshit, you're coming with me." So he humoured him, and they went along. And he um he took him into the bar, into a bar, and obviously they, straight away they, the Americans tried to kick Jim out. And Dasher told him to sit in the corner, and he just said, "No, nah, no, nah, mate, he's he's not black." And uh, like, yeah, he's black. Like he said, "No, he's not." He's, 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 an, he's an Aboriginal, he's an Australian Aboriginal and they're very dangerous people and good fighters. I wouldn't go near him if I was you. And of course, I don't know whether it was uh, because um, they believed him or because it was Dasher and you didn't really argue with him. Um, they let him stay and let him drink and um, Dasher took him all over Kong Tri City and into every bar and got him blind drunk. And Jim said to, uh, to Dasher's daughter, many, many, many years later that it was one of the greatest days of his life and he totally forgot that he was black, totally forgot. And he just went out and just had the absolute, the 
greatest time he'd ever had. And he says also the drunkest he'd ever been in his entire life. And Jim Sharp ended up being um, the first black mayor of um, Flint, Michigan. Famous Flint with the water problems in the documentary. He was that mayor. So a uh, famous man in the end and um, a very, very good soldier. But again, it's just diff different times and different people and the difference between the Americans and the Australians. Dasher didn't care um, for, for laws and rules and, and proper officers. And uh, he just it wouldn't have meant anything to him. He just wanted to have some fun with his mate. That's what he was like. He and that story, Michael. That to me, it, like especially with the kids, and like it just summed Dasher up. And when I was reading it, like when I was reading your book, I, I just, I just sat there and I was reading, and I just went, "He's a bloke, Dasher, that you would, you know." And we'll we'll get to it in a we'll get to his final, you know, his final patrol with Butch in a minute. But he's a bloke that you would love to sit down and just have a beer with and just and just talk about footy, talk about life and just he's just one of those blokes that you've just got the utmost respect for. Like I you know, and reading and it's just such a tragedy what happened and can you it leads us into now, we'll talk about his final patrol and what happened with his great mate Butch. Yeah, it's sad. Um and, and you're dead right about that by the way too. It's um yeah, it was something special. But um, Dash had spent sort of five months in the north and he was transferred after some, spent some time in a place called the Fort of Death with Jim Lowe, this horrible fort um, where they went and they should have been killed, but they survived it. Um, and he was um, sent south to Trebong, which is a base further south, a little bit further south in South Vietnam. And he would be teamed up with an old mate of his Butch Swanton and a bunch of other Aussies who were down there, a few more than he was working with, um, still not many. It's And he'd be working with the, the mountain people, the uh, Montagnards. So uh, it was, it's, he was actually given leave um, famously just before uh, his last patrol. Could go anywhere he wanted, you know, to, for a few weeks just to, you know, go to Singapore or Shanghai or whatever he wanted to do. Uh, or, Tokyo or whatever they went, wherever they went, he decided he'd heard that um, that one RAR were, were in town, but were in Vietnam and and they weren't far from where he was. So rather than going off overseas and then having a holiday for two weeks or for a week, he decided to go and visit the men at one RAR. And uh, the day that from the men, I've spoken to a lot of men that were there when he turned up, and it was like, it was like the Messiah walking in. So it's like the king had just walked in. You know, when they walked into base and it was bloody Dasher and it was the, they all talk about it's just the greatest moment of their life. And he spent five days there just drinking barbecues, mucking around, having fun, relaxing. And then he went back south and left them. And um, and, and there's a tragic coincidence there too, because he wrote a letter um, just after he left, just before his last patrol to the men of one RAR telling them how much he enjoyed that and um, how much he, he loved them and, you know, keep your head down and we'll be seeing you soon and look after yourselves. And that, that letter is actually now on display in the one RAR museum in Townsville, by the way. Um, anyway, his final patrol, um, it was a typical patrol where they were, it was, it was a bad idea, um, but that was typical. That's what they faced. So it was further out than they'd normally go. So they'd be, about 10 kilometres away from the base, there'd be no chance of artillery support uh, to destroy a um, company of VC, which had been spotted in the area. And it's a very strong VC stronghold area. So they went out, so their company, one one was about, sorry, there wasn't one one anymore. His company was about 90 men, so three platoons. And as they got close to the point where they thought the, the enemy were, they split off into three platoons. One went north, another one, went sort of northwest with Captain Pazarkas, an Australian uh, with a um, uh, with the the commanding South Vietnamese officer and an American by the name of Sertian. They went sort of northwest and Dasher and his mate Bush, Butch Swanton, the two Australians, took the third platoon and they pushed along the river west into a rice paddy. And the idea was to clear their, their perspective areas and meet up at the village where they thought the VC were and destroy it. So they, they had to go through this, this rice paddy, which wasn't a great idea, but they, they had to push through and they did. 
Um, a long story short, they, they got out in the middle and they were ambushed. Um, and it got really, really serious. Uh, from what I can gather, um, I, I thought probably a company of VC, Viet Cong, I think it might have been closer to a battalion, to hundreds of people, um, and at least two machine guns embedded in a uh, that. So if you can imagine, they're in a, a, a wide rice paddy with jungle to the north, there's a river to the south, and there's a road to the east, and sorry, the west, and on the, there's a village on the other side of the river to the south, and there's machine guns set up in there. And they opened fire on, the, fire on them, and, and as would happen, quite regularly, his South Vietnamese men fled and left them. Um, they abandoned them because it was not a good situation. And um, one of the, uh, the the South Vietnamese boys was was hit by machine gun fire and Butch Swanton, the other Australian warrant officer, to his enormous credit, um, went to this man's aid and uh, with, a, with a young medic and tried to get him out of the mud and back to the jungle. And he was struggling with this kid, trying to get him out. And um, the situation got worse and worse. Machine guns opened up and more people came to attack them and Dash's men just pissed off one after the other. Um, in the end, it was, that, it was basically Dasher standing between the enemy and Butch, who was trying to carry the South Vietnamese kid off the field, the battlefield. Um, and Dasher was putting himself in harm's way creating a shield and doing what he could with his SLR to keep these people off. And eventually poor old Butch got shot um, uh, badly wounded in the chest and the kid was killed. Uh, so he dropped him and um, so Dasher went over and it's a, Butch was basically his best mate at that stage or close to it. Um, they played footy together. Um, and I don't think that had anything to do with it. He would have done it with any, for anybody, but um, so he went over and examined him and clearly uh, the medic was still there and the medic told him that Butch is going to die. Um, his wounds are mortal, his moments, minutes from death, Butch was still alive. Um, said, you need, to, you need to leave. And bear in mind, while Dash's men were retreating, he was covering them. While they were leaving them, him and Butch to die, he was laying down cover fire to let them piss off to the trees in the north, leaving him to die. And he... he he still protected them, just the way he was. So uh, the, the the medic left and said, you've you got to go. He begged Dasher to leave Butch. Um, he said, there's nothing you can do. He's going to die. Dasher wouldn't do it. And he'd taken the radio off one of the, the, the radio operator at the stage and was contacting Captain Fazakis, the other Australian, who was to their north, and he desperately asking for help. So Captain Fazakis was coming south to try and give some aid, and half of his unit had pissed off. Um, they didn't want anything to do with it. So he was left with about 15 men or less, probably about eight when he hit the rice paddy. Um, they just weren't reliable soldiers. That, some of them were good. Um, I'm sure Keith Payne would, would you know, testify to that. Some of his men were very good, but they, they did. They abandoned the Australians quite regularly. So um, Dasher took it on himself to, to carry Butch off the field. Um, to try and fight off a couple of hundred people uh, with his SLR and carry this bloke through the mud. So you can imagine he's copping fire, just enormous amounts of fire. He's got the radio on his back, his weapons, his kit. He's carrying a man. He couldn't do it. He, he dragged him and dragged him. And in the end, he had to discard his radio, which for an Australian soldier in Vietnam is basically suicide in that situation because you can't. You know, there's a big heavy radio, big packs that go on your back. He couldn't physically carry it. It was impossible. It was either get rid of the radio or leave Butch. So the radio went and he continued and he dragged him off um, and just continued to just try and basically just waiting to die, just dragging him towards the trees. And about 20 metres from the trees, a young South Vietnamese kid, um, Din Do, his name was, um, witness a bit of this and uh, came out to help Dasher carry Butch the last 20 metres into the trees. And together they dragged him, again, under intense fire, um, back into the trees and actually got him off the field and into, into cover. Um, and then Dindo um, 
examine Butch and the enemy at this stage were coming through. I think um, at this stage, Captain Fazakas had hit the other side of the field and were putting pressure on the on the Viet Cong from the flank. So about 20 of them or 15 of them came through to kill Butch and Basher. And uh, this kid again examined Butch and sort of confirmed that, yeah, look, he's, he's done for, mate. You can't do anything. He's going to die. Um, begged him again to leave. And uh, but Dasher refused. So, in Dindo's sworn statement, he um, last saw Dasher kneel over Butch um, with the enemy closing on his front. Dasher was out of bullets, he had no rounds left, so he had two hand grenades. So, if you can imagine, he was kneeling over his mate with a hand, he had two hand grenades, hand grenade in each hand, outstretched, pulled the pins on both. Um, he just knelt over his mate and just said, Look, you're not getting him. Um, and Dindo ran for his life and the enemy closed on, on his front and um, and they were killed. So he just refused to leave him. And that's obviously a brave thing to do and a selfless thing to do. But I, when I was writing the, that part of the book, I found it impossible because I know Dash's kids and I know his widow and it was so hard to write. I couldn't do it. I actually wrote it um, the last moments through butcher's eyes because um i think it's really really important to put how it, what dasher did to try and put it into perspective look try and look at it through butcher's eyes so you've got to remember like he, he's he's in the mud he knows he's dying he's going to die thousands of miles from home like countless diggers before him he's going to die without his mum there's nothing he can do about it he's going to die alone um but his mates with him and it's bloody Dasha Wheatley. It's not just a digger, an Australian soldier kneeling above him. It's Dasha bloody Wheatley. Butch Swatton would have known beyond any shadow of a doubt that Dasha was not going to leave him. That there's, he would have absolutely known it. He would have looked up and he just looked, there's no way this bloke is going to leave me to die on my own. And you've got to remember these... Butch and Dasher were special forces. They weren't stupid people. They knew what the VC, the Viet Cong, did to people. Where if they had their way, the Viet Cong did not shoot you when they caught you. They would typically capture you and torture you, skin you alive. You would die an agonising death over a long period of time. Dasher obviously couldn't bear the thought of Butch suffering that. And he would have fully expected the same fate himself he must have been expecting to be tortured to death um and for what he couldn't save butch he could have easily dindo got away the stick jungle behind it could have easily got up and run and saved his own life and the same result for butch would have died but he bloody well didn't he stayed there and he didn't give him an inch and and he he faced it down just for his mate because he couldn't just didn't want him to die alone. That's unbelievable. And you, you imagine what that meant to Butch Swanton in that moment, um, the difference it made to his last seconds. And it's, it's interesting that the Viet Cong didn't capture them, didn't torture them, they shot them. Um, and it's, I think it's from, from what I've sort of established in the book, it's primarily, I think, because of the pressure that Fazakas and Sershin were putting on their rear, they had to eliminate them and get back to the fight very, very quickly. Otherwise, they would have been captured and tortured. I uh, say so it's unbelievably brave. But if if you want to, if you know of a better example of mateship, Australian mateship, I want to know. Tell me, because I've never heard of anything like it. Anybody doing anything like that? It's unbelievable. And I know a lot about Victoria Cross actions. They're all brave. They're all unbelievable. But this one, like I said, it's different. It's not. Fats McCarthy going over the top. It's not Albert Jacker charging 80 Germans. It's just it's just Dasher in the mud with his mate. They just wouldn't let him go. And it was the Queen was so moved by what he had done. She actually intervened and changed the citation for his Victoria Cross, which has never happened before. Because the initial writing um, suggested that he'd use those hand grenades on himself. Um, she did her own investigation, as she always does, and, and proved that he didn't. He used those grenades on the enemy, which he didn't have to do. Uh, he could have committed suicide. He, he could have given one to Butch, one to himself, with, like you see in the movies and like they used to do. Rather than be captured by the Viet, Vietnamese, they blow themselves up. He didn't. 
he used the grenades on the enemy and he stayed and he just come what may you're not getting him um and she changed the wording to make it absolutely clear that this was not an example of suicide or self-immolation it was it's fella uh, it's michael like it's just in the true sense of the word it is mateship it is it is not letting it's standing by your mates not letting them down and you know it's something that you've just and it's something. Look, it's just something that I, by listening to you, we all fit. We all, you know, we all say we've got mateship, and you know, we we all, you know, we won't let our mates down. And and you know, like I know myself going, like I'm a volunteer fiery, and and you know, when I go out on the truck, it's it's mateship. It's you know these these and anyone in military or police or ambulance or whatever whatever it is, and you know, everyday life as well. We all feel there's mateship, you know, but this is a true, this is, I've ne- like you said, this, this action, there's never been an action like, you can't, in any other action, I can't, like you've said, and I've read your book and I've read, I've read the VC accounts, there's nowhere else where it's, where it says, you, you, like, this is the true mateship in, in its own sense. Like, the, it's just unbelievable. Yeah. And the, um, the military still talks to their people about what he did um and there's a reason for that they they put him forward um you know that the the boozer at um Kanunga is called the dasha wheatley vc bar you know um he's well remembered and well respected and talked about a lot within the military because it's such a great example um you know we all talk about football at rugby or or aussie rules or whatever mateship and looking out for your mates and geez if they want inspiration and <laughs> just learn about just just i mean that's a high bar we're not we're not expecting anybody to actually do what he did um but gee, it's something to aspire to isn't it oh it is mate and i think like you've said oh, like you've just mentioned it and it's a really good it's a really key point that you touch on where these days we throw around heroes you know like sporting stars like people say oh he's such a hero and he's you know he's no, uh, Dasher is a hero in, in the true sense of the word. Dasher is a is a hero, and you know he is a role model for anyone to look up to. That any young person would be proud to look as him as a hero and and see the actions that he did on in nineteen sixty five. Are just they're unbelievable. You just I, what would have been going through his head too to know that he was. Going to face absolute. Like he he, like you said, threw away the radio. Suicide. He, you know, he had a young family. He had his wife back home in Sydney. To to do what he did to face death. I just, I, I couldn't do it. There's just no. There's just no way. It's the thing about the Victoria Cross. I, I I don't I don't think any of these people think they could do it either until. But Dashes is, um, yeah, it's a lot of them, you know, you, you can maybe put it down to anger, um, desperation, doing your job, you know, um, there's, you know, Fats McCarthy again, and um, there's so many other, like Frank McNamara and, and Jacker and all these men, and it's Keith Payne, another one, you know, that they're in a bad situation something's gone terribly wrong people are dying and they need to they need to get out of the situation not just themselves they need to fix the situation dan karen another great example think something something has gone wrong something needs to be done so they i, I don't know you if you get a chance to ask dan why um i don't think they i don't know that they always think it through maybe it's anger sense of duty i don't know but it's just i think for a lot of them it's just um fixing a situation trying to get out of a situation trying to get their friends out of situations but dashes wasn't that's not what it was it's just humility it's just love it's just it just reduces you as a person to think about that kind of courage what he faced and the reason he did it, um, like I say, he could have easily left a grenade with his mate and just ran. 
he would have lived. No one would have begrudged him. He probably would have been decorated still um, for what he'd already done. And by the way, bloody Butch Swanton, how he hasn't been decorated, I don't understand. I, I can name Victoria Cross recipients who have received the Victoria Cross for, for trying to carry wounded friends, foreign wounded soldiers off the field of battle under withering fire. Mark Donaldson's one. And rightly so, he deserved his Victoria Cross. It's what Butch was doing. Cost him his life. Trying to carry, carry that kid off the battlefield. Unbelievably brave. Unbelievably brave. The Vietnamese, South Vietnamese, decorated him. They gave him the, the uh, Military Medal of Merit. It's the highest award, second highest award they could possibly give him. We didn't give him anything. Nothing. Not even a mention in dispatches. Nothing for that. It's extraordinary. Um, but that's that Vietnam was different, you know, politically it was a quagmire and, uh, yeah, it's one of the things that really annoys me. Um, I feel for his family, you know, what a brave man, you know, and you, you sort of, you look from Dash's eyes and you think, and maybe that's why he did it, you know, um, seeing what Butch was trying to do and everyone pissing off and it's their mate, not, not. Butchers it wasn't an Australian. He was carrying off the field, but he stayed. Mate, good on him. Good on him. Absolutely, mate. It's it's just it's a like it's a story that um, until I saw your book, like I I I didn't really know Dash's story. I didn't know it, and I you know I I I'd seen it in a bit of a, a documentary, and and it was. It was in a documentary that uh, was done a few years ago that that they asked Neville House the when when he won the first Victoria Cross for Australia and and they asked him they said what were you, what were your thoughts and he said I was concussed I fell off my horse I was concussed and I I just ran out and didn't know what I was doing and I just grabbed the and it was just like you can't there's just no, there's no words. What a ripping soldier that man was. Yeah. Too. What a ripping, like, unreal, Gallipoli and amazing. Oh, yeah. But you just, you just sit there and, and you think there is no, like you said, there is no, there is no answer to what these men do. There's just no, there's nothing, as you said in the store, like when you said in, earlier in the podcast, there's nothing to say there's there's no it's not a class thing there's no you can't put you you just cannot put what it is that is at the end the only thing that i come close to is what and it's dash's dash's victoria cross action mateship it's it's not letting your mates down it's you know going out and getting martin o'meara going out and getting the wounded it's it's the uh, when you're on that bat when you're on the battlefield you you with your mates. You you're fighting. You're not fighting for king. You're not fighting for country. You're not. You're fighting for your mate next to you, and they're fighting for you. And and that's I guess the only thing that I can put in Michael that it is that is mateship. That's to me. That's what the Victoria Cross stands for is mateship. It's got to be a huge part of what it's all about. Um, I mean, it, it's it's just maybe it's just as simple as that. Um, because they have nothing in common. I've looked, and I'm not not just Australians. I've looked at there's 1,376 of these men. That there's nothing. There, there's there's nothing. Um, it's just it's just human nature, and it's um, and, and what I think the timing of this book, you know, with everything that's happened in the world in the last couple of years, and you know the, the politics that have come around, and you know, I just think what sometimes, you know, Australians being encouraged to hate Australians. And I just think, what would Dasher make of all this? How stupid would he, <laughs> would he think a lot of the things we complain about today are, you know? And I think it's, it. hopefully people read it and it just reminds them. It, I think, I hope, and this has got nothing to do with me. I believe honestly that this is the book Australia needs right now. It's because of, because of him, not me. Um, it just, just to remind you, just re- just remember what we are capable of, Australians, when we're out to look after each other. You know, men, women, children, all of us. Just remember when mateship was the thing we talked about and no one cared about politics and you were just an Australian. And you remember all that? Yes, I do. Um, and I, I just think there's there's something special about that man. And um, it, it 
ties in with his his larrikin side and that you know he just didn't take any he just wouldn't take any of this stuff we're going through today seriously you know he he would if he needed to he certainly would but um it, it just hopefully serves as a reminder that with everything else is going on australians pretty magnificent bloody people uh, mate i think you've just hit the nail on the head with I think it's. I think we've lost our way as a, as as a country. I, I feel you know we really have lost. In it's it's a vital point that you touch on with what's going on in the world today. It just you're a hundred percent correct. This is a book that you know, and I, mate, I I couldn't put it down. Like I, I started reading it, and mate, it's like you said to me, and and I give you when when you spoke to me off air, it's. You, you said, oh, it's not my writing, it's Dash's story. Mate, you've done a, a fantastic job in capturing everything of Dasher Wheatley, the man, the soldier, and, you know, you should be very proud of it, mate. It's not your writing. I could, I could see what challenges, like this would have been such a challenge to take this book on and also the pressure that you would have been under to write this and give him the respect and honour that he's due. Oh, thank you. That means a lot to me, mate. Yeah, it, um, yeah, it was daunting and it was extremely difficult. And I actually wrote it. Um, I've been working on it for years, obviously, but when the deadline from the publisher came and um, you know you paid in advance and it's it's game on. You got to do this. Um, shut shutdowns hit for the third or fourth time, and I was homeschooling my daughter. Um, it was hard. Yeah, it was really really hard. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you, you just because it, it, it's such a like I said before, it's a wildly entertaining story. I don't know if that's the right or wrong thing to say, but it is because he was just that sort of a person. Um, and I got to say, there's a lot of stuff that could be in that book that is not in it. A lot of the stories people told me about Dasha, <laughs> everyone has a Dasha Wheatley story, uh, and they're unbelievable. Literally, it. Uh, but there's truth in all of them. There's a variant of all these stories that are true. And if I couldn't find that variant, I wouldn't like the frog one is such a famous one. I've heard 20 different incarnations of that story about him biting the frog and how it happened. And, and the, the one I went with was from somebody who was there. And it's documented and written about in another book. So, but there's other ones that I just couldn't verify or just were too inappropriate because you can imagine young bloke, alpha males drinking, you know, <laughs> you, um, for who he was. You, you, you obviously take care for the family and, and respect. But um, yeah, it, it was a lot of fun um, to do, but also, yeah, challenging and, and frightening because he's such a, he's held on such a high pedestal by better people than me. He really is. Um, people that I look at with awe, like governor generals, um, generals, serious special forces people, um, look at him in disbelief and awe. And I'm like, well, who the hell am I? <laughs> you know, and I look at these people in awe and they look at him, Dasha, the same way. It's like, shit, I'm right down, I'm beneath your boots. So it's very daunting, but all those people helped me. Um, all of them, um, which which is the only thing that made it possible. And the family, above all else, and Edna Wheatley, my God, Dash's widow, what a woman and what a story. She's a second hero of that book by a mile. Incredibly, incredible woman. Well, I was just about to ask you, so what was the aftermath of, of Dash's death and how did it, how did it change the way that Australia dealt with the overseas losses of service people forever this was a huge story if you go back through trove um it was on the front cover of just about every newspaper in the country it was all over the tv the radio dash is dying because he was well known within the military obviously he wasn't a celebrity outside of it but for the way he died pardon me and and what he'd done is obviously brave and obviously dramatic and it captured people's attention and imagination and Australia had a policy at the time of not bringing fallen soldiers home. We didn't during World War I and um, they were buried overseas. So uh, when, when Basher was killed, um, despite the fact of what he'd done, um, the Australian 
government said that they were not going to bring him home. And his mother was just, you remember, she'd already lost her other son to the army. She was unconsolable I and mean, she was just devastated and she just wanted him back she just wanted to bring him home bury him and say goodbye it's understandable um but no matter how much he begged and edna his widow um he maybe had four young kids he was only 28 and the australian government refused and Th dasha was very famous through all three armies involved that we were involved with so the australian army the american army and the south vietnamese army they all knew him, everybody, and they all loved him. Um, and when the Americans found out that the Australian weren't gonna, Australians weren't going to bring him home, they were appalled, absolutely appalled. Um, just before Dasher was killed, another AATTV guy, uh, Scott, I think his name was, had been killed. Um, and he'd made good friends with an American, a Marine. And one of the last things he said to him is, if I ever die, please take me home make sure I get home to my kids. And of course we wouldn't bring him home. So the Americans intervened and um, the same thing happened with Dasher where they even offered to supply an aircraft for free um, and take him back. And the Australian government said, no, nah, no, you don't, you're not doing that. Just refused. So uh, th this became an enormous story because the family was very distressed about this and it was already gathering you know, a lot of momentum, the story because of the way he died. And it was obvious he was going to get a Victoria Cross. Um, so it got bigger and bigger and the Don Lane show got involved. Um, they did a fun, Don Lane show to put it in perspective. There's nothing like that these days. It was, television was everything. There was three channels, that's it. And he was the biggest. And they did a special, a fundraiser to try and help bring him back. And it was all over the place. The RSL got very, very aggressive. Edna Dash's widow worked for the RSL, um, a local sub-branch uh, at that stage. Um, and they fired her for bringing them into disrepute because she wanted to bring him back. And the RSL didn't agree with the idea of bringing soldiers back. And it's just got enormous. And the amount of political pressure that this raised, it's hard to put in perspective. It was a very big story. Um, in the end, uh, it was three businessmen from, I think it was Lapine Funerals, um, paid to bring him back and paid for his funeral because the Australian government refused. No matter what people said, they just wouldn't do it. In the end, it turned out it was going to cost them, I think it was 300 pounds. That's all it was. They didn't want to pay. Bear in mind, had he survived, it would have cost them more than that to bring him back alive. You know, they didn't mind training him, paying to send him over and getting him killed. He just didn't want to bring his body back. It's, it just, not, none of it makes sense, but that's the way it was. And obviously it's not like that anymore. And, and so in um, January, so this, this Dasha was killed in November. Um, so um, in January, um, they changed the law forever so that Australia, like the United States now, will, will, will go to all lengths, necessary to bring a fallen soldier home. Um, he was the catalyst for all that. He was the first. Um, and uh, so that changed Australia more for, for forever. It's, I think it's, it's only, it's only fitting that he came, come, comes back and came back to Australia and, and is buried back here at home. I think it's, it's fitting that he, his final resting place is in Australia because that was, you know, that was his home and, and, it's Michael. I can see that you know. I've been to the Western Front. I've been to Gallipoli. Oh, there'd be so many families. I've got family members that that were killed over there, and and they lie in foreign fields. I I understand it, but I feel that it's if we've got war dead, that we should be able to bring them home these days. I, I really I really think it is that we bring them home and bring them back to their homeland. And it's a different thing too, isn't it? Because it's we didn't have the means to in World War One, correct. World War Two. We didn't didn't have the logistical power that or the money that we do now. The Australia is Australia is a powerful country. Yes, um, our military is enormous. It's easily bring our war dead home, but it wasn't the case in World War One. It's completely different. Yep. So no disrespect to any of that. It's totally understandable, um, but it was not the case in Vietnam. It was well within the means of the Australian government to, to bring fallen soldiers home. It was easier bringing them home dead than alive, literally. 
Um, so there's no excuse for it. But um, but you're right. But but it, it was a different thing, mm. and people had changed by the sixties. It's something that you mentioned earlier that, and it's I hate bringing into it, but it's politics. Politics is you yep. know where. It's always a way that we, you know, we, we're very quick to send men and women to war. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's politics get in the way of things and, and it really shouldn't. Yeah, it's just, it's just, it's just the way it is. Um, and it, it's needn't be that way, but it is that way. It's, it's really unfortunate. And, um, I, I often say that, that the, the government should give anybody who deploys to an active war zone a gold card when they return. So that's, uh, if you don't know what a gold card is, what people don't know, it's uh, basically free medical benefits for the rest of your life, private medical. Um, a TPI veteran like my dad, um, if you get TPI pension, you get a gold card. So that's anything that goes wrong forever. It's free. Yep. That, yep. And that would be massively expensive, but maybe it would make them stop and think a little bit. It's like, oh shit, we've got to send some people overseas. Do we really need to? Because it's going to cost us a lot of money. Um, and if you need to, yeah, fine, send them. Absolutely. If they've got to go, they've got to go. But bloody look after them, and don't do it if you don't need to. Yeah. You know, mate, you've just hit the nail on the head with you know absolutely that they should receive benefits for the they've they've signed well, on just the a gold, even just the gold card. Yeah. So well, they they just you know. <laughs> Yeah, if they're 25 and they've come back from overseas, they don't need a pension. They probably want to work, but yeah. give them a gold card. Uh, so if I, they get sick, they're fine. Absolutely. I think you, it's a veteran, they've signed on the dotted line and they've they've signed with their life that, you know, they've signed the blank check that they could one day give their life for their country. Like it's 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 a very... It's a very huge responsibility, and it's a massive sacrifice. And it's you know, it's sacrifice on on the families. It's sacrifice, yeah. you know, for them. Like you know, it's it's a big thing to to sign up and say you're going to fight for your country. It's a massive, you know, it's a massive responsibility, and and uh, one that's not that's not taken lightly either. So. Uh, yeah, I agree with you, mate. I think it's just a gold card just to say thank you for their, you know, for the sacrifice that they've made for our country. I, I agree with you. I think it's a, I think it should be something. Yeah, okay, it, it's going to cost a bit, but I think it is uh, warranted. Absolutely. So, yeah, and it might, it might slow the politicians down a little bit too. <laughs> if it's, do we really need to send troops? Abs- <laughs> you know, I mean, and as I say, if you do. By all means, that's what they're there for. Yep. But if you don't need to, don't, yeah, don't. And yeah, like they, they're putting their their health and their physical well being on the line to serve their country. So look after their health and physical well being as best you can. And the best way we can realistically probably is just to give them a gold card. Absolutely. So for you, Michael, how do you want Dash's memory to be remembered in Australia? I uh, that that word mateship. Just, you know, um, again, not, you know, if you to go back to sports and, and all sorts of things, if you, you know, you hear, hear them talking about mateship and, you know, putting other people first, well, okay, put put this bloke forward and, and, and put that up. There's your bar. There it is. You're never going to get there, but that's okay. Um, and, and that's, you know, for, for, and not just that, also for the, the fact that he was a family man and he was young. He was only 28. He's very, very young. He had everything to lose. Um, so obviously, uh, and and his his family, you know, poor old Edna and, and the the horrors that she went through after after he died, and um, you know, some some really terrible things were done to her and the kids, um, some horrific things. But when it's all said and done, you know, you um, people when they think of Dasha, just think of mateship. Absolutely, I made it something that you absolutely that you know mateship is. It's something we all you know we all we all stand by, we all live for, and and Dash is that that bloke that he is someone that should be remembered. He is someone that is a true hero in every every sense of the word. He had everything to live for, and you know twenty eight. He, 
like I'm I'm 30 this year, Michael, and I look back to you know like that is just like two years ago to say all right, my life's over. Like it's just and you know I told you off air that you know at 22 I wanted to you know I was I was going through my own mental issues and I I was mental health was bad. I I was suffering from depression. I did want to end my life and through the last seven years, I've worked my butt off to be in a great space and be doing this. And I look back now and and like I look at life now and life is the greatest gift of all. And and I'm, I'm in a happy place now. And just to think that, you know, when I was 22, but now and, and bringing it into context for Dasha's story, his life is over at 28. And, you know, he had so much more to give to, to the army, to the Australian army, to his men of one RAR and, and to this country, mate, we've lost an absolute hero. We, you know, we lost a hero that day, like, you know, and just, just, and, and his mate too, Butch, like, you know, we lost his mate, like, you know, we shouldn't forget Butch, yeah. Butch in this story either. Butch and Dasha are the true heroes of this story. Yeah. And the Keith Payne wrote the forward and, and I'm mates with Keith and he, he talks about, about Dasher and I remember in, interviewing him, him for the book years ago, a few years ago now, you know, and he just talked about, again, you could see the hurt in his, in his face and just, just trying to put into perspective the loss that they, they all felt, you know, and that it was tragic, that it was, it was the loss of a very important person who could have become, <clears throat> you know, something, quite significant maybe and Keith certainly seemed to think so um yeah and it it did it it, the shockwaves of his death rippled through the three armies and it devastated them there's excuse me there's a picture in the book and and of a uh when uh so as we talked about before the um Australian government during the Vietnam War wouldn't allow foreign countries to decorate Australian soldiers so when there's a picture of his what we would now call a ramp party. So when when he was been his funeral in Vietnam before, um, you know before he came home, where there's a picture of a a South Vietnamese general pinning his own medal for gallantry on D- Dash's coffin, because he was so disgusted that um, the Australian government wouldn't let them give them the awards that they wanted to give him. And there's um, I, I'm. Can, I, pre- I know this is true, but I, I can't, couldn't find a picture of it. But a, apparently, a, a, I think it was a colonel uh, from the Marine Corps did the same thing with his silver star, um, pinned it to his coffin. Um, those medals never made it to the family, by the way. So I've never been able to verify what happened to them. But there's a picture of the, the South Vietnamese general doing it. So like, it affected a lot of people. It really did, you know. Absolutely, absolutely, and you mentioned that uh, you ca- like you're currently working on getting. There's a couple of other awards that you you're in. You're working on how how's that progressing? Is it is it progressing well? I think so. Um, it's so hard to tell with these things though until um, you sort of get there. We've still got a bit of work to do, but there's some. All I can say about that is there's some very very um, good people involved and the case for it is watertight i mean it's just a i mean it's it's an absolute it's 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 outlined in the book very very clearly that the awarded the awards that he didn't get why he didn't get them um and and we've got documents for all of it we can back it all up the paper trail is is there and it's i've heard from the pretty much most powerful people in the in the country that um that it can be fixed, that it that it, it is a clerical error. So basically what it was, so the action f- for the girl uh, where he was supposed to be, we've got documents saying he was to be awarded mention in dispatches, which is ridiculous. He should have got a probably a D- D- DCM or a military medal for that. Um, that one and the bayonet charge up the hill where the Americans gave him the silver star and the Queen's people said DCM or VC where he got nothing. What, what happened, both of those actions were written into his original Victoria Cross citation. And we've got paperwork from, uh, I can't remember who it was, uh, somebody um, in the UK, I think, or it might've been chief of army here, saying, take them out of that citation. So the citation had three actions, the girl, the bayonet charge, and when he died. 
uh, he, to take them out, those two other actions are superfluous. His, what he did for Butch Swanton that day is more than enough to warrant a Victoria Cross. They're irrelevant, take them out. So they were taken out and forgotten about. So no one's done anything wrong here. No one's, they didn't change their mind and say, oh, no, we don't think he deserves some after all, or he got the VC and that covers it because we've got paperwork saying that, that, that I've got the original citation where they're in and I've got the final one where they're out and I've got the paperwork ordering them to take it out. So it's watertight. So we know why it happened. We've got documents after action reports, citations from both of it, everything to back up 100%. Uh, even recommendations of what awards should be given. So it's a very clear, open case um, where it's very, very simple. We know what happened. We know why he didn't get them. It's fixable. Let's fix it. But you've got to, got to get the right people to do that. And you really only get one chance at it. So I don't want to do it. I'm not trying to don't want to do it on my own. The family doesn't want to do it on their own. They're trying to get some people smarter than me um, to help. And it's progressing oh good i'm i'm glad mate it's it's as you said it's to to give dasha the the recognition he's due and hopefully that and give the family the recognition that they deserve as well for this this brave man it, it's you know it's it's fitting it'll be a fitting way like you said if 56 years later he finally got his silver star in in january that's that's fitting and now if these these other things can be corrected it's a fitting way to to honor his memory absolutely and it, and it matters it's it's really important the gallantry awards don't fix ptsd they don't bring people back from the dead they don't make your life better necessarily awards like the victoria cross can make your life orders of magnitude worse um, because you become so famous once you've awarded them. And a lot of them will tell you that, but it matters because it's the right thing to do because he earned it, you know, it, there's, and there's a lot of reasons for that, you know, that um, it, it offers incentive for other people to, to try and aspire to do the same things is the obvious one, but also it nails people to the wall by like people like Dasher. It, it ensures, and Dasher, Dasher will never, be forgotten about don't get me wrong he's got a victoria cross he's never going to be forgotten but all these awards all have their place and they help us remember these people and through these people people like dasher and, and all the others um, we can show the broader picture and this is what i love about the victoria cross particularly stories like dasher where it's it's such an easy sell it's such an incredibly entertaining story Right or wrong, we are attracted to stories of violence and death and war. We are. Um, they sell and they interest people. And when you bring them in through stories like this, you show them the, pit, the broader picture of history behind them. People like my dad, just normal people who just went to Vietnam and did their job. Um, and there's plenty of them in this book who didn't get the Victoria Cross, who weren't killed. And it helps us remember them and help us remember that, well, Dasha wasn't there on his own. You know, there's lots of other people there with him and it they it's they, these things can really help us remember and, and like i said pin things to the wall so to speak to say well well we're going to remember that and okay we'll, we'll go down go down that rabbit hole in, in looking into his story and it you see it with kids I see it a lot with a vc book you know they start reading about these men and they're unbelievable stories and they start reading and they go oh now there's more like they, they, i didn't the Vietnam War was this thing, and that this wasn't just well, it wasn't just Gallipoli in World War One. Oh, look what Jacob went on, and he did this, and they learn about the different battalions and the histories and the war, and it opens them up. It's a the Victoria Cross is a really, really good way to get people interested in military history. It really is because they're such incredible stories, and especially young people, they just love it, and they. They really soak it up, and then they it opens them up, as I say, to the broader picture behind these men. Well, mate, it's like what you've said. You've just said it. it only there's only ever been awarded 101 of these medals. Like there's 101 awarded. Like that's you know there's they they out of the you know uh, nearly. 400,000 that enlisted in World War One that, you know, or even go back to uh, the Boer War and, and, you know, like uh, you go right through only 101 men 
have have been awarded this special award. Like it's that says it in it in it in itself. Only a, a hundred and one have been awarded this this honor. Like that's that says something, doesn't it? And it's I think since World War Two, um, like seventeen or something in seventy. Yeah. Like it's it's extraordinary. It's it, it is so hard to be awarded a Victoria Cross these these days in particular. It is so difficult. Um, if you've received the Victoria Cross, uh, you have done something extraordinary. And the way the system works, and I outline it in the book, the way that the whole constitution of the cross and the way the, the way that they are awarded, they are watertight. If someone is awarded a Victoria Cross, they earned it, no matter what they did. You don't get the Victoria Cross for being a good bloke. You don't get the Victoria Cross for being popular. You get it for doing something extraordinary. You get it for valour. Uh, and it, it, there's plenty of people who should have got it, who didn't. And again, I say this in the book, politics can stop you getting the Victoria Cross. Absolutely. It can't get you one. It's impossible. It doesn't work that way. Absolutely, mate. It's, it's, an, it's an amazing, as you said, it's an amazing medal. It's an amazing honour that is that 101 of our brave men have been awarded, and it's it's just it's fitting that you know, and as you said earlier on in the podcast, that Queen Victoria such forward thinking, such forward thinking to think of every uh, to open it up to every man, every man, not just officers, and and thank God she did this because you wouldn't hear these stories of Martin O'Meara. You wouldn't hear Dasha Wheatley's story. You wouldn't hear Cam Baird. You wouldn't hear Mark Donaldson. You wouldn't hear Dan Curran, all these other, Kenner. You wouldn't hear these stories of these men and what they did. So thank God she did what she did. And, you know, I take my hat off to her because it's allowed, you know, us to tell these amazing stories. And thank you for thank you for sharing them, mate. Like, thank you for writing the Victoria Cross Australia Remembers for your first, you know, that started you off on Dash's story. And thank you for writing Dash's story. It's it's just an amazing story. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and just quickly, Martin O'Meara is, you made a good point. Martin O'Meara is a great example of that. No one would ever have remembered him without the Victoria Cross. He would be forgotten, one hundred percent. Absolutely forgotten. Absolutely. Um, and his story is bloody important. Absolutely, it's important to you know, and thank God we we do remember him, mate. And you know, he became famous for that action, but also what happened to him after service too. And and it's a great example of what can happen after service. And it's like you said earlier on, his story is is just one of it's just pure sadness and and mate even even dash's story is one of sadness too they're they're all the, the i find the posthumous awarding of victoria crosses are the most they are the sad stories they're the ones that you know you you do shed a tear when you read their when you when you read their citations you you do shed a tear when it's posthumous posthumous award and you see the posthumous it it's it, you, you can't help but shed a tear. Well, for me anyway, I, I shed a tear because I read them and you, you can't help it. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, Hugo Throssell's one oh. where, um, you know, it's one of those bloody hell, you know, it, it took he shot himself with his service revolver many years after the war, you know. Um, it, it's not happily ever after Victoria Cross. Like I said, it don't people think that oh well they've got the vc they're rich and famous well there's no money you're famous but that's probably not what these people want um and it can make your life worse and it often does it really does absolutely so just to finish up michael why do you feel it is so important to tell stories of our servicemen and women well like like i said before it to to open people up to the, the mistakes of the past, you know, and to, you know, I think at the point we we're talking about with the gold card, you know, that, that idea and, and that sort of thinking can only come apart, be, come around because you've learned about military history and you understand as a family member, the toll that serving your country takes. 
Um, it doesn't just affect the veteran or the service person. It affects the entire family. It can affect the whole community. I mean, it, it's when somebody goes to war, it's a big deal. I often say to my customers who bring medals to me, um, especially World War One, World War Two medals, that you know, you, you're holding some medals, um, you know, from your great grandfather from World War One. It's like, do you, do you know what this is? You know, World War One and World War Two are the biggest things that have ever happened to the human race. Period. There is nothing, even in the Bible, that we can verify that actually happened that comes close to those events. They were enormous and they always will be the biggest events that ever happened to the human race because we won't survive World War III. It's been possible. So to have somebody involved in that in your fat, it's a big deal. Uh, you need to remember it. You need to learn about it because it's important because, like I said, if we do it again, we won't be coming out the other side of it. And if you're not remembering, you're not talking about, talking about it, you either will repeat it or if you don't, you won't look after the people who go and do these things for you. Um, and you... Ignorance is not going to get you there. Ignorance isn't going to help these people have good lives. It's not going to help their families. It's not going to help us repeating mistakes. Well said, mate. Well said. It, it's and it's an important thing that you touch on that no one wins a war. And like you said, we, we've, it's, we've got to honour these men and women that have gone away and, and done amazing work for, for our freedoms that we enjoy in this country. We are so lucky in Australia to, to have the freedoms that we have. And it's, you know, we're so, we, we can't complain at all in this country. We don't have, you know, wars going on where, you know, where that, you know, in the Middle East, there's wars going on. There's been wars going on for thousands of years. You know, we've, we are so lucky in this country and, and like you said, it's to honour these men and women who go away and do amazing work for us and, you know, that's that's what we should we should remember about why we should tell these stories and I, I say it in my podcast all the time, Michael, that without knowing our past, we've got no future, we can't go forward, we've got no, fu we've got no future and I, I feel it's important for the younger generations to understand what their forefathers and their, you know, their mothers and, and grandmothers and aunties and uncles have done for their freedoms. And, and that's why I want to tell these stories because I believe they're important to just to honour these men and women. That's what it's about. Yeah, I agree. And you're doing a bloody good job, mate. I'm really, really thankful for this opportunity. I'm very glad that you're doing this and there's people like you and Alex and others out there who do, do a very good job of this um keep going mate just keep doing it because it's 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 in, you are serving your country doing this it matters um and you'll it's the country will be better for it it just will thank you mate thank you i i appreciate it it's you know you you know you and i've spoken off air and it it's it's a passion mate it's an absolute passion it's an honor and a privilege to do what i do you know speaking to the likes of you and and veterans and historians mate i'm very honored and very privileged to do what i do and i love it and i'll continue to do it and yeah so all i can say is thank you for thank you for coming on mate and thank you for writing dash's book for one and thank you for writing the Victoria Cross Australia Remembers, mate, because it's a book that is, it's, uh, they're both fantastic. They're fantastic books. And I highly recommend anyone out there go and buy Michael's book. You will not be sorry that you did. It, it's a fantastic read. And I absolutely got a lot out of it and Dash's story. And Michael, your, the way you wrote it, it was, it was brilliant. And mate, uh, all I can say is thank you once again for coming on. And what are you working on now, mate? And what, how do people get a signed copy of Dash's, Dasha Wheatley? Uh, well, if you want to sign copy, you can get them pretty much anywhere. There's an audio book out as well that's doing really, really well. Um, it's actually, it's, it's quite good. But if you want to sign a copy of the book, the best way is to get it from my website, um, which is michaelcmadden.com.au. Uh, yeah, michaelcmadden.com.au. Um, you can click on that and that'll take you to my military medal website where you can actually buy it and you can put in there... Um, if you want it personalized and, and I can do that uh, for anybody. And for what I'm working on, I've just, um, I've got a contract with um, a publisher to do six children's novels, um, which is just so much fun. I've written the first two 
uh, and I've just got the first one here yesterday that they turned up and that drops on the 6th of June. It's called the Stacey Casey series um, for kids. So the kids book is totally different. It's back to my roots, back to, to fiction. Um, it's a series of six books. And the second one comes out in um, uh, August, and I think the third around Christmas time. So I need to get right in again. So working on that. Um, and it's uh, after writing about war and death and, you know, all the hard things, this has just been an enormous relief and great fun. And I, I actually, in the first book, I sneak a Victoria Cross recipient into the first book. The kids travel back in time and they meet Joe Maxwell, PC, because it's me. So. <laughs> <laughs> nah, mate, it's, it's been an honor and a privilege to, to have you on and, and just tell Dash's story. And, you know, I'm, Mate, I'm sure we could have sat here for another four hours and just spoken of of the book. And but, guys, this is only a taste of what Michael's written in Dash's book. So go out and and buy Michael's book and read the Kevin Dasher Wheatley VC story, and you will not be sorry that that you have read such a such a, a hero and and I'll, I use this term Michael and I think it's fitting legend I, I legend is not a you know it's it's a word that's thrown out I don't use it lightly it's yeah dash is a, a legend a, a true legend in in every sense he is perfect word actually the book was originally going to be called Dasher legend and Bella because they were the two parts of him um, that sort of struck me at first was, you know, the, the legend that he was and obviously his valor, you know, but um, yeah, no, he, he was, he was a legend. He really was. Absolutely. And I think it's a, a fitting way, mate, to, to end the podcast. So Michael Madden, thank you for coming on True Blue History and sharing Dasha Wheatley's story. Thanks, mate. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. On the 13th of November, 1965, at approximately 1300 hours, Warren Officer Kevin Wheatley, known as Dasher Wheatley, was on patrol with two other Australians, Captain Phyllis Vazakis and another Warren Officer by the name of Butch Swanton. They were on patrol with their group of South Vietnamese soldiers, the Civil Irregular Defence Group. They were patrolling an area about 15 kilometres to the east of the Trebong Special, Special Forces camp looking for a battalion of Viet Cong who'd been spotted in the area. Their company split into three different uh, platoons. Dasher and Butch took a uh, platoon and went west. Captain Fazakis and an American Marine by the name of Sergeant took a, uh, another, uh, another platoon and went north. And the third went sort of north east of that area. After patrolling along a river, uh, Butch and Dasher with their, with their platoon moved across the road and into an open rice paddy. Uh, this was an, an open area of ground with a river uh, along the south and a small village on the other side of the river, a road behind them to the west, and it was walled to the north and east by very, very thick jungle. It was a wide rice paddy, about 200 metres wide. As they moved through with uh, orders to clear that rice paddy and join up with the, the other two platoons to the north, uh, they were ambushed. Originally, it started with some sniper fire. Uh, eventually, uh, the fighting grew heavy and they fell under attack from what we believe was at least a company, possibly more, of Viet Cong fighters. Trapped out in the open, uh, a South Vietnamese soldier was shot and wounded. A warrant officer Butch Swatton picked up this young kid and tried to carry him off the field out of the open rice paddy and away to the jungle in the north. Uh, unfortunately, as Dasher tried to, Dasher Kevin Wheatley tried to lay down cover fire for Butch, uh, the re remaining South Vietnamese soldiers fled under the attack. Uh, very quickly, the offensive grew. Uh, there were at least two heavy machine guns uh, secured in a pit on the south side of the river in the village that were opening fire and the men had no cover. Dasher put a call through to Captain Fazakas, who was to the north 
uh, Fazakis struggled to bring the company commander uh, to convince him to, to bring his platoon south to help. Uh, he refused and in the end uh, Fazakis left with about 15 of the men on his own. Him and Sertian moved south to assist. Before they got there, uh, as Butch Swanton was carrying the wounded South Vietnamese boy off the field, he was shot in the abdomen with machine gun fire and went down. He was examined by a South Vietnamese medic, uh, one of the few who were still there, as Dasha laid down cover fire still. And uh, the medic told Dasha that in no uncertain terms that Butch was done for, that he was moments away from death. And given the seriousness of the situation, that he should leave him and retreat, uh, Dasha refused. The, me the medic left the field and the two Australians quickly found themselves alone, just Wheatley and Spotton in that rice paddy uh, with at least 100 to 200 people to their south, all concentrating on them. Vazakis to the north was moving south. He, he called in an airstrike and a helicopter medivac. They never arrived uh, and he continued to push south to try and help. In his desperation, as Dasher tried to fight the enemy off, still refusing to leave Butch, who he could not save, uh, he picked him up and started to half carry and half drag him through the mud of the rice paddy to the thick jungle to the north to try and give him at least some cover to perhaps wait for an airstrike or something to happen. Uh, he found this very quickly to become physically um, impossible. It was impossible for him to carry all his gear, his weapon, Butch, and he also had taken the radio off one of the men before they left, so he also had the very heavy radio on his back. He was forced to leave the radio to drop it, which was a very, very difficult decision to make because in that situation it cut him off from the rest of the unit, which meant that it was very unlikely that anybody would find him, but he had to do it. He couldn't physically carry everything so he discarded the radio great risk to himself and continued to fight and carry butch off the field of battle when he was about 20 meters from the trees he'd somehow made it that far a young south vietnamese private by the name of din do uh, witnessed what they were doing uh, came out and helped dasha carry butch the last 20 or so meters off the field and into the the thin protection of the jungle uh, I don't know how they make, made it, but they did. Dindo examined Butch, and it was very clear to him that he was now just moments from death. The enemy was now closing. Um, there was at least a dozen to 20 people coming through to kill them. Dasher was out of bullets. Um, Dasher, uh, Butch could not be saved. He was... Uh, there was very, very thick jungle to the north. Uh, Dasher could have e easily left him and retreated into the jungle, he would have easily got away. But again, he refused to leave his mate. Dindo left, and as he ran, he ran when the enemy had closed to about 10 metres of Dasher. Uh, he turned and he saw Dasher Wheatley kneeling above Butch. Uh, Dasher had two hand grenades left and no rounds. He took out those hand grenades, pulled the pins on, on both, and was last seen kneeling above Butch with a grenade in, in each fist arms outstretched, facing the enemy, waiting for them to close. Dindo ran and heard two explosions of the hand grenades and then some small arms fire. He retreated and at this stage, uh, Fazakis came through into the field and, and, uh, and flushed the enemy out and forced the South Vietnamese to retreat. They never, uh, they never found Dash, Dasher and Butch that night until the following morning when Dindo returned. Uh, he took Captain Vazakis and Sertian back to the site where he had last seen Dasher, and there they found both bodies. Both men had been shot to death. They were laying down peacefully beside each other. Uh, they hadn't, Dasher hadn't used his grenades. They, he'd used those grenades on the enemy, not on himself, uh, and they had been shot to death. Obviously, um, for this outstanding act of compassion and selflessness, uh, Warrant Officer Kevin Wheatley was awarded the Victoria Cross, the preeminent award in the world for, mil uh, for members of the military under fire. Uh, and he also was awarded a Silver Star 
by the Americans for an earlier event, uh, which took 56 years to receive. The South Vietnamese awarded Dasha a Knight of the National Order of Vietnam, Class 5, uh, a Military Merit, Merit Medal, and a Viet South Vietnam Cross of Gallantry with Palm. Uh, the three highest awards they had. They also gave Butch Swanton the Military Merit Medal and the South Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry with Palm. To this day, Butch has not been recognised or, or decorated by the Australian government for his efforts in trying to carry that South Vietnamese lad off the field. Uh, Dasha is buried at, buried at uh, Pine Grove Memorial Park in Western Sydney and his Victoria Cross is on display in the Hall of Valour in the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. He's survived by his four children and his widow Edna. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review for the podcast on whatever platform you get your podcasts. And if you feel like supporting us, you can now via our Patreon page. That's patreon.com forward slash true blue history or buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash true blue history and check out our new website trueblue history dot com for more great content.